And one of the things that I thought was pretty cool is challenge versus a threat. The challenge or a threat meaning a challenge is I get to do it. How do you help athletes reframe that? Some things are out of our control. Who wants to think that you don't have control? But let's be realistic. I can only control so much of that. Motivation, I always say, is the gas that makes the car go, but discipline keeps you in the car. First thing, I don't care if they're pro athletes to a little girl, the first thing they do when they mess up, oh, oh, oh man, <laughs> and that right there tells me, huh, you get e easily flustered when things don't go your way. Some doubt creeps into an athlete's thoughts. How do you coach them to kind of try to block that? How do you get rid of or stop it? That's the first mistake, because when we suppress thoughts, we tend to think of them more. I saw one of the videos that you did I watched a bunch of them over the last couple of days, and uh, one of the things that I thought was pretty cool was a challenge versus a threat. Oh, I thought that was pretty cool. Can you elaborate on that? So yeah, I like using that one because we're going to face stressors in life. That's inevitable, right? So I break it down as either see it as a challenge or a threat, meaning a challenge is I get to do it. So thing like in track, we're just saying I'm a track guy. So see a hurdle, right? The hurdle's coming. You're like, okay, let me go over it and get ready for the next one. That's a challenge because you know there's a hindrance or no, there's something blocking you, but then you know you're going to overcome it. Now a threat is the opposite. You see the challenge or the obstacle, whatever it is, but now you're retreating and you fall back. So if you see it as a threat, you already put yourself in a position not to win or not mm -hmm. to succeed because you're saying, I'm going to succumb to defeat before even trying. While challenges, I may fail, I may get defeated, but I at least put myself in position to overcome. So it's all about being in the right position, not necessarily I got to win because you can't control outcomes, but you can at least put yourself in position. Those hurdles are pretty high. What about <laughs> if someone, <laughs> yeah, what about if uh, someone doesn't have the skill set quite? Maybe they got to look at it from a slightly different angle. Most definitely. And I talk about this when it comes to confidence a lot because you got to be real with yourself. Like we're just talking about lifting and stuff. You can't think your way and mindset your way to a 500 pound squat. You got to know what what is my assessment right now? Is it 225, 250? So if in that regard with mental skills, if I know I'm not as mentally strong or I, I falter when things get hard, then let me be honest with myself because there's nothing worse than low confidence. It's the only thing is false confidence because now you're going to put yourself in a position not to do it. So that's whack how your, I look at it. Yeah, whack your shin on the uh, hurdle and mm -hmm. and uh, cause yourself to be like, I knew I couldn't do that. And now you feel worse, and now right. you program yourself for defeat, and now you're like, I'm not going to try again. It was really cool, the stuff you were doing out in the gym this morning, uh, hitting up some bench pressing, and then in between, you were standing in front of, I think, kind of like, kind of like an I iPad, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was giving you, like, colors, and then you were going based off of the colors, Um what, what have you found uh, in training yourself and training other people have been the benefit of this kind of thing? Well, first and foremost, you got to stay engrossed in the task the whole time. So not saying you, you don't do that in fitness, but you can kind of like slightly wonder when doing a rep or something and come back and it won't be too detrimental depending on the weight, of course. But with these tasks, the moment you're not thinking about it, it's gone and you missed it or you did it wrong. So that task had the color, it's called the Stroop Effect. And his name after a guy named John Ridley Stroop. In 1935, he did a study to see if a color spelt in an incorrect ink, so say red written in blue, blue written in green, so forth, if they are able to overcome inhibitions. So typically we just want to go and read the word. If they can stop themselves, they'll have a faster score, meaning they can read a list of words in X amount of time. But those who had trouble with impulse control and inhibition, being able to not just react on the first go, they did worse and messed up or did it slower. So bringing that to a physical standpoint Instead of just saying it, and that's kind of my premise with some of my tasks is now I'm going to make a goal-directed, I won't say movement, I'll say behavior for a better word, a goal-directed behavior to be the outcome. So now it's not just being a thought. I have to put that process into real time. Mm. Okay, real quick, because the Stroop thing is it's going to be really interesting to go into, but back to what um, you guys were talking to on the challenge versus threat thing, I forgot the name of the Stanford psychologist or whatever, but it was this lady that I was talking about. Um, Carol Dweck? It's not Carol Dweck. It's an, it's another white woman though. <laughs> <laughs> it's From another Stanford. white. Yeah, yeah. Although Carol Carol Dweck, what was that book? Uh, Growth mindset. Gro yeah, that well, her, yeah, the, her book. Um, that book was amazing. But there's this other lady that was talking about how there are individuals who perceive stress as being something that can help them grow, something that could be positive. And then there are individuals who perceive stress as a threat or something that moves mm -hmm. them back, right? So how do you help athletes reframe that? Because that's a really big deal. If, if you're going to be an athlete, you're going to be, training is going to be stressful. There's going to be aspects of life that's stress training. There's, there's a lot of stressors that are coming your way. And if you can change the way you look at those things, that'll massively help you become a better athlete. But a lot of athletes and people, a lot of stressors fuck with them. 
right? Mm -hmm. So how do you help athletes reframe? So the first thing I would look at is what are they stressed about? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people don't ask that question because we talked about it a little bit when we we're lifting. It's like, what am I exactly mad over or frustrated over? Because sometimes it's an underlying issue. Like if you say you went to work, had a bad day, and you come home to your wife and start yelling at her that that transference, you're like, oh, I'm projecting this on you, but it's really because my boss gave me a hard time. So sometimes we don't even know what we're stressed about. So the mm -hmm. first idea going back to the athlete is, am I stressed because I have a high demand of workload physically? Do I have, like, with my pro athletes, media stuff to deal with? Because that's a whole other can of worms. And in my student athletes, it's like, okay, I have school. I have to keep a GPA. I got to be a student. I have to have a social life. So am I stressed for what reason? After you identify that, then look in, can it be changed? Mm -hmm. I think that's something people overlook, too. Some things are out of our control. I know it, it sounds bad to say that because who wants to think that you don't have control? But let's be realistic. There's 8 billion people on this earth. There's all types of natural occurrences. There's financial occurrences, emotional responses. I can only control so much of that. Let's be real. I think there's something about us in modern times, right, that we think we have more control than we really do. Mm -hmm. So identify what you do have control over. And in psychology, they call it control the controllables, locus of control. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing I invented. But basically, there's something called the circle of control. It's a technique that many uh, mental coaches use. And just imagine a circle. There's inside, there's a small circle. And that small circle, it's what you directly affect. So I can change what time I get up for work. I can change how hard I work, how I feel about a situation. Now, outside of that circle is what can I influence? Now, I can influence my efforts to get that job opportunity or get that girl to like me on a date, whatever it is, but you can't fully control it because they have a factor. And then outside of the big circle, that's the last part, is what I can't control. I can't control the weather. I can control the coaches, the referees, uh, the other person's choices and emotions towards me. So once you identify what those are, then you can take the steps then fix it. So those first two factors is what's stressing you and what you can control. And then that point, that's when I say, okay, let's work on the ways to cope and deal with those stressors. And maybe you can figure out a way to control them maybe just a little bit, Yeah. Um, such as the referee, you know, maybe you can address him with respect, you know, when you see him at the warm up. maybe you can, you know, acknowledge that he's another person. Hey, how's it doing? going today, sir? They might be on to you. Mm -hmm. That you're looking for them to call the extra fouls and things like that. But uh, it's worth a shot, you know, to be kind to people and to see uh, how much influence you can have. Because someone like Michael Jordan, you know, he would say, I can control the, you know, he can control every variable is what, what he thought in his head. And if he thought that in his head, then maybe some of that was true. Well, that's a, I guess, a, you know how to say fake it till you make it. I believe mm -hmm. in that to an extent. So, he, like you said, he couldn't control everything, but he at least set the parameters in his mind that he could. Mm -hmm. And there was a video I watched on YouTube a few months ago. I forget the name of it, but they use this like mindset of like this toxic winning, which I wasn't mad at that. See, I'm kind of different from a lot of the mental coaching people in a sense of I'm not going to give you overly positive stuff. Yes, some of my stuff will give that positive message, but sometimes it won't. Sometimes you got to say, I'm going to win at all costs within means like obviously you don't want to cheat live and get into the you, you familiar with the dark triad. You ever heard that term? Before? I have. OK, I so have. you can maybe get into that. But you don't want to be that person. A dark triad. That's a person who will Cheat, steal, Is it Machiavellianism, Machiavellianism, na narcissism, Narciss and psychopathy. Psychopathy. My yeah. man, that, that's good stuff. Cause <laughs> we talk about psychopaths and narcissists. I think that word gets overused. Mm. It's like, oh, they think they're good. They're a narcissist. No, like I'm a competitor. Why shouldn't I think I'm good? And that's why people, like sometimes on IG, I get feedback. Good, of course, but I get some like, well, you can't just make people think the better you got to be humble. I'm like, to an extent, like I definitely know I'm not the best at everything. Uh-huh. So, but let me know what I'm good at. I'm not going to negate that. Like, why would I do that? And we're both, all three of us are athletes. So th I think that mindset, more people should adopt. Like mm. you should have a certain, they call it, I think it was like toxic winning. I, I don't want to quote it, but it was like something like that of to the point that you will do anything within means to get it done. And I'm, that's how I carry my business out now because there's people in similar fields that I'm cool with them, but I'm going to beat you in a, a healthy way of like, I'm going to provide quality. Mm. So people say, I want Nick's stuff. What yeah. about creating a little bit of a, like a persona? Oh, identity. you know, some yeah. of the guys can do that, right? Some of the guys are like, I'm, I'm this way outside the ring. I'm this way normally. I'm normally calm. I'm docile. But, you know, Tyson was kind of a little bit of both in and out of the <laughs> ring, right? But he said that he had so many insecurities. He, he would cry before fights. He was always terrified. But as soon as he stepped inside the ring, as soon as he got inside those ropes, he's like, I'm the killer then. People can say what they want about Mike, but... I like that mindset because I use a, an analogy with my athletes, even the pro ones all the way down to little kids. I have a nine-year-old gymnast that I was telling you I was in a hotel working with, 
and I used it with her, and I call it superhero athlete. And now I'll, I'll ask you, who's your favorite heroes? Mm. I see Goku in the back, but <laughs> I did Goku. Goku. Uh, it would be between Goku and Black Panther. Yes. Okay, let's go with Black Panther. What about yeah, yeah, yeah. you, Superman? I don't know. So those are perfect. The reason I like it better than Goku because Goku didn't really have too much of an alter ego, but Black Panther can work, yeah. and so can Superman. So I'll go with Superman because his is a little easier to analogize. Yeah. So same thing with an athlete, right? You have this persona in the field, in the ring, the court, whatever it is, and those traits that come with that, there's a certain athletic identity, that's what we call it in sports psychology, that you have to be that high competitiveness. You have to do what it takes, isolate sometimes from your social you know, circle because you have to win or be the best. So you have to wear that mask, that's Superman. But who's Superman when he's not uh, saving the world? He's Clark Kent. And Clark Kent's personality, people think he's this docile clumsy kind of nerd, even though he's like 6'3", 220 pounds, <laughs> but you put on some, you know, some glasses. Yeah. <laughs> but the glasses throw it all out the window, right? Forget, <laughs> forget them knowing his real identity. They still think this man's a loser <laughs> because he, he's a news reporter with glasses. But anyway. Still walking around like a 60-inch chest. Yeah. <laughs> you feel me? Pecs, like, pecs hanging all out the front. characters <laughs> and all, Dressed well. Yeah. All the characters Hair's that perfect. play Superman are jacked or got jacked for the role. Like Chris Reeve wasn't super jacked, but he was like, I think, 6'5". Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then Henry Cavill was like 6'1", 220, solid. So <laughs> that guy, but get to my point. <laughs> they have to wear different masks or different identities. And the same thing in sport. I have to be a killer in the ring. I have to be the killer on the court, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. But I can't carry that because that's, one, emotionally draining. Because how long can you have that kill, 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 go, go, go mindset before it eats away from you? Like, see it in the movies, like when there's a literal killer and mm -hmm. eventually it starts getting to them. Yeah. And we can even go on a tangent on that, but get to the point is you have to turn that off at some point. And on the other side, as the Clark Kent, the their main identity, their real identity, uh -huh. that's the athlete who knows when the I lost, but it doesn't mean I'm less of a person. Because mm -hmm. I've seen people who tied, even when I was an athlete back then, to even my current clients, and they'll tie it into their personality and say, well, if I lost here, I'm a loser there, outside mm -hmm. in the real world. And that's the problem. So going back to Mike Tyson, I think... It's not perfect, but that, that's a good way to look at it. Like, you have to shift those lanes. You have to. Yeah, and Ali obviously did it. But Ali even later on said, like, he didn't believe half the stuff he said. He just was just, <laughs> like, he he wanted to put it out there to build himself up that way. Think so he worked. put that energy out there, and now he was accountable for knocking the guy out in the third round. And then there would be a good opening, and he knocked the guy out in the third round. And I guess that's the other side of when you talk about false confidence. I guess for the people watching, take this in consideration, too. They all could back it up. Mm. That's the thing we they got a skill set. Yeah. Conor McGregor comes to mind as well. Exactly. Right? So you can't just say it too because I've seen young athletes who try to carry those same Conor McGregor or Floyd Mayweather, whatever it is, personas. But let's be real, most kids until maybe junior or high school, for the most part, skill wise, aren't the best. Maybe raw talent, but I know most people I played with. I'm from South Florida, where when uh, we played football, every game was like a state championship. <laughs> Even the worst teams were like four or five star recruits were on those teams mm -hmm. so you couldn't take any days off so we knew we had to be realistic you can't be that guy saying yeah i'm gonna score this many touchdowns or i'm gonna win all the games i'm going d1 mm -hmm. you're like basically yeah, right, bro <laughs> you have to be real sometimes you're d3 <laughs> and it's not wrong with that because yeah. guess what if you going back to my point identifying where you're at now i can go forward and say i'm going to be the best at this level and if it gets an opportunity to work up then work up you never hear anybody say i'm d3 <laughs> of course I i'm guilty I, I said i'm going to um I was like, I'm going to the U. I went to camps there. I, I told you I ran a 4 4 40. I was the same size height wise. I was like 190, but I was ideal, but my skill set didn't fully get there. And guess what? I didn't sign with anyone my senior year for football. And I ended up luckily getting a, a partial track scholarship at a small uh, D1AA school, Bethune Cookman University, is a historically black college in Daytona Beach, where it helped me get on this path to the psychology mm -hmm. where I changed my major like four times. Mm -hmm. I was very indecisive, but I took a class of psychology and I'm like, I think I like this. And that was back in 2008. So there was a guy, Dr. Ian Payton. I haven't talked to him probably since I graduated, but he doesn't know his class shifted me to psych train. And now look what I'm doing. So thank him mm -hmm. out there, wherever he's at. Mm -hmm. What are the athletes that seem to be stuck in a mindset of like loss? Because you mentioned, you know, for example, Ali, he said a lot of things, but he was able to back it up. Mm -hmm. Even Conor McGregor, before he became the champ, he was talking like he was the champ, right? And you got to imagine, like, if that's your goal, you need to have that in your mind. But you can't talk like that if it's your first fight. But some some individuals, maybe they're sparring and they're getting beat right now. Or they're just not where they feel that they want to be. 
but you still need to have a level of confidence and belief, right? How can you build that from ground zero? So I guess it goes back to my other point because yeah. that first time fighter, he has literally no experience. Well, at least in the, the official fight, he might have sparred mm -hmm. or practiced like you said, but he has to know that when I do this, there has to be a level of expectation. So going to your point, he has to expect something, right? Yeah. So I say that should be a high level of competitiveness of being a winner. You, you don't want to walk in there and say, man, I'm going to lose because it's my first time. Nah, but you uh -uh. should have an expectation. So going to the point is have a realistic expectation. If you know that you, because you, you know where you stand, let's be real. No matter how good or bad athlete and how much they lie to themselves, deep down, they know where they're, they stand. Yeah. So the, the either the coach or the athlete himself, depending on the age, it's easier to do it. But if you're younger, it's harder, obviously. But mm -hmm. they have to say, okay, this guy I'm fighting is, let's say, 5-0, and oh, and I'm 1-0. Mm -hmm. oh. My first fight was against a, a no-name person. Yeah. Can you realistically say that I will go through this effortlessly? You're not going to say I'm going to lose, but you're going to be like, okay, I know how he fights. I've seen his competition, how they fight, and how those fights went. Because mm -hmm. I think there's this notion of, oh, I'm my only competition. Yes and no. Obviously, you got to beat yourself first. But like I said earlier, I want to be the best in my field when it comes to this mental coaching and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking at similar people, whether they're in the same lane or not. Like I look at Jordan Peterson stuff all the time. I look at Huberman stuff all the time. Not to say I'm going to beat them, but I'm like, if they're doing this, I need to know where I rank. If their videos are getting this kind of engagement, what am I not saying to get that engagement? So going back to your point, mm -hmm. if I'm an athlete getting ready for a fight or whatever sport event, where do I engage, or where's my uh, interaction at? Am I doing the things they're doing? Am I getting the outcomes they're getting? Now, for one fight, you can realistically say probably not, but you know you can at least keep up with them and yeah. then build from there. What I like from what you what you mentioned right there is because like we were actually just, we just did a podcast on uh, guys and body image and, and how like a lot of people are paying attention to social media and because they're comparing themselves to people all the time, it's like fucking with how they look at themselves mentally. But when it comes to being a competitor, you have to compare and, and being an athlete, you have to compare yourself mm -hmm. to not just your other competition, but maybe on guys on your team. If you're trying to be the best on your team, you have to see, oh, fuck, he has better dribbling skills than me. He has better athleticism than me. How the fuck can I catch up? You can't be living in your own world where it's me versus me and never comparing yourself to other people. You have to be OK to do that. You have to be OK to see where you stand and see how you can improve. Exactly. And the thing going off of that is because when they don't see that, they put them in a box like a, like a bubble almost. You know how people who don't get to see the world or they only live around their only circle of friends and they get into a real situation, what happens? They, they fall don't apart. Grow. Yeah. yeah, they don't grow. They fall apart. So that's the same thing with that. So you have to be like, okay, like you said, he's a better dribbler. How do I get to his level? Because even if your teammate is still a person that you need to either compare yourself to be better then so you can help the team or at least equal to because at the end of the day those skills are needed i think sometimes a player on a similar team with somebody might be frustrated after practice that somebody else got the praise you know hey and seema's rebounding really well today he did a b c and then someone else thinks that means that the coach took a shot at them or the coach said mm -hmm. something negative about them but they didn't they said something positive about him and rather than the next player thinking about how they're going to beat him which isn't that bad of an idea too, because it's good to have competitiveness even within your own team, is how can I contribute? You know, how, what, okay, he has those skills. I got other skills. I can pass. I can do this. I can play defense. I'm going to do that as hard as possible for the next couple of days and see if I can get, because I would love the coach to say that about me. But a lot of times I think people are like, well, well, well how come the coach didn't say anything about me? But then they don't do anything about it. So that comes into, hear the term, um, like intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Because mm -hmm. motivation is a term that gets thrown out a lot. And there's, some people say, oh, it's not about most motivation, it's about discipline. Or it's, <laughs> I say versa, it's, yeah. it's, it's all of the above because motivation, I always say, is the gas that makes the car go. But mm -hmm. discipline keeps you in the car. Because let's imagine if I got all the gas to go from, I'm from Florida, so here to California. Yeah. But if I don't stay in the car, I get out in Texas or wherever, stop. Guess what? I'm not getting to my final destination. So those people who don't have that wherewithal to stay with it, they're not going to be able to accomplish it. Mm. Now, to the Stroop test that you, we, we started talking about a little bit, you know, some people see that stuff. Actually, <laughs> you mentioned the story to us about how the first time, you know, you, you showed that on to, to a lot of people on UFC, right? Some people see it and they think it's a, a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Why is that beneficial for athletes? So the, the simplest answer, I'll go from the cognitive side and I'll go from the more mindset, psychological side. So yeah. from the cognitive side, 
it actually works. I know you brought on numerous brain scientists, so your audience probably have heard this, but it works regions of the brain that work on inhibition control, goal planning, and error detection, right? So this is something like a loop almost. So when you see the Stroop color, so if the color mismatches the word, red written in green, green written in blue, et cetera. So the first thing is the part of the, the brain, the prefrontal cortex, where we make decisions, plan out, rationalize what makes us human, right? Mm-hmm. So the first step is planning. The plan is color, not word. Simplistic, right? This is why it looks gimmicky because, okay, you're looking at a color, whatever. But from the, the neuroscience side of it, you're actually having to plan out what to do. That's part one. So the second part is error detection. So there's something called the ACC, which is the anterior cingulate cortex, which is error detection, emotional regulation, reward response. So you see where I'm going with this. So now if I detect, okay, it's not red. It says it, but it's written in blue. So now I detected that I'm fixing the error, which is it's not this color. I fixed it. Or if you don't, you say the wrong thing and then you recognize, wait, I said red when it was supposed to be blue. Either way you look at it, your brain has to recalibrate to some degree. Yes. So that's the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, this is where we talk about dopamine response. So the VTA for short. So after you did the correct or incorrect response, now that dopamine reward system has to say, good job, behavior that I needed was fulfilled. Back to square one, the, the color you saw, go back to it again and repeat. Now, if it was wrong, guess what? It's still so the thing with dopamine. People think it's only for the bad responses. Mm-hmm. No, it works for the 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 bad the, uh, the good response, I should say. But it works for the bad responses too, or the negative responses too. Look at like drug addiction. It's giving a reward or a motivation to do the behavior again because your body is saying, "I need this." Mm-hmm. So same thing with the training. If you do it wrong, you're reinforcing the wrong behavior. So that's the beauty of those drills. At face value, look like a, a fun brain game, sure. But you're teaching from a physical standpoint how your brain needs to, one, interpret information, two, correct yourself to whatever degree, and three, reinforce it. And you saw I did the one outside. It was like 45 seconds to a minute. So a minute of that, you're conditioning your brain. Literally, that's why uh, we coined it cognitive conditioning because like strength conditioning is the same way. You get under a a stimuli, whether it's a 300-pound squat or a 400-pound bench, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. it, it forces an adaptation. And the same thing with our brain. So that's the cognitive side. Yeah. Now, going to the mental or psychological side, if I do mess up in real time, the first thing, I don't care if they're pro athletes to a little girl. I have an eight-year-old daughter who does some of these drills, and it's almost identical. The first thing they do when they mess up, oh, 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 man. (laughs) And that right there tells me, huh, you get easily flustered when things don't go your way. Not everyone does this, but that's the beauty of different personalities. Like like the next thing's coming. You got to keep going. Perfect. Exactly. So that's where that part comes in from the mental, psychological side, because now not only am I reinforcing it cognitively, I can change or sustain my, my mood because some people do sustain. I have people who literally mess up, do it again, mess up, do it. And they keep getting frustrated to the point where they stop. Yeah. I've had people get paid a lot of money on a certain day to do certain things. Walk away from these tests. Just think about like the essence of like an athlete breaking down during a game because maybe he made a bad pass or, or a fucking grappler mm-hmm. who some, he gets swept. And he mm-hmm. just gives up on the match. Right, you don't feel good about yourself anymore. Not as confident. Ah, uh, yeah, it's this sunk. Is, down, you know, if it sinks down, like I think the other guy can feel that. Right, this mm-hmm. is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It trains. I think uh, you know, sports are exactly what you're pointing out. I mean, this game with the colors, and I know you have like lots of variations of of that. That's what sports is. I think that people don't recognize that, but every like everything is like pattern recognition. You know, so someone in basketball does a head fake. And like, why do they do a head fake? It's like, well, they're faking a shot and they're trying to get the guy to jump. And if the guy jumps and they wait till he jumps out of the way mm-hmm. and then they shoot and they make it, maybe they know that the guy is going to go for the, maybe they, you know, maybe they did a head fake earlier in the game and now they just lay it right up and the guy didn't move at all. The guy's just like frozen in football. There's so many different things uh, just because I played the sport for a long time, had opportunity to coach it and stuff like that too. But on something like a screen pass, if, if you're an, a lineman and you're going to block somebody, Play after play after play. You keep running the ball and running the ball and running the ball and running the ball. Every once in a while, you throw it. But on something like a screen, you actually literally just get out of the guy's way. And the defensive Mm -hmm. player has no idea what to do in high school. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, college pro, they get on to you. But, like, you keep hitting into the guy over and over again every play, 20 plays in a row. And then all of a sudden, you stand up high And they just mimic what you're doing. I don't know why, (laughs) but they stand up high too. You move out of the way and they're like, quarterback. (laughs) And they get to finally get towards the quarterback, which is every young defensive player's goal is to try to kill the quarterback, Mm -hmm. kill the guy with the ball. And the quarterback's like, 
Boop. Bink! Just throws it right over your head to the running back who's now off and running because there's four or five defensive players that are all concentrated on the quarterback. So <laughs> sports are like this time and time again. You see it in, in baseball with pitching. Maybe a guy's known to like back a guy off the plate. He backs a guy off the plate once by throwing a you know fastball kind of inside. And then maybe the next one, he's like, you know, maybe he normally has a pattern of throwing a couple uh, balls first before he throws a strike. He knows that the guy is anticipating that. And rather than backing the guy off the plate at all, he just lets one rip right down the middle. Mm -hmm. And the guy's like completely frozen, just swinging it. Yeah, caught looking. There you go. Well, have you heard of a term called cognitive flexibility? Yeah, it makes sense. That's here. So it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. or mental flexibility. So, going to your point, the reason I bring it up is the reason they get frozen because we have to be able to shift our thinking in real time. And, like you said, the pattern recognition two strike or two curveballs, and he usually throws a changeup or a changeup and a fastball, he's probably throwing a curve next or whatever the case may be. Yeah, why does a changeup work? It's like a 60 mile an hour <laughs> ball. Like and it should never name, work, but it's just because it's like a slow dud compared to mm -hmm. how much heat the guy was throwing the other ones. So, that's where mental or cognitive flexibility comes in is to be able to offset what typically will happen like thing like logic if this happens then that so like if i said if it's raining it's probably wet right but if it's wet it doesn't necessarily mean it's raining so in the same context you have to be understand that all because he threw two uh, curves or a mm. change up whatever it's like expecting both sides of the outcome now it seems pretty straightforward but we really don't do it we usually have a straight linear path to see this because our brain likes to make shortcuts of everything mm. right and it's it's a it's a evolutionary adaptation. I always say a term called "there's no more saber tooth tigers" because <laughs> we got newer software to an extent, but the hardware. If you took a person and stripped them naked from 2023, no good ideas, guys. But 2023, put them in 1702. For Not us. Part, <laughs> I see where you went in there. <laughs> Okay, let's imagine and not <laughs> let's go to 1980. Well, maybe just not the United States. <laughs> yeah, I said not America. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a point. Okay, not us. But I see. <laughs> but you give up. Okay, I got you, bro. I got you, bro. If it's me and you, it it me and you me like we're somewhere on the West too, Coast, like, yeah. the Ivory Coast. Yeah. yeah you so <laughs> you're not seeing a difference until we talk, yeah. right? There's even studies and research who who talk about this how from the last thousand or 2,000 years that we, we're kind of getting dumber because we're, we're still the same people. So getting back to the point of all of this is like, we're not changed that much. So these things that we do, our brain wants to get to a point where you automatically get a response. Because what's easier, right? Okay, if I think about the directory of the angle of his pitch and the way he released it, and also he usually does two strike or two curves and two change-ups, and then he does this, how much time are you going to have to actually swing? Mm. Not a lot. So the brain says, let me just go to the simplest example. Matter of fact, I'll give you a perfect example. Ready for this? I do this in my class when I used to teach um, at the local college back home. I'm going to give you four options. The question is, what is the most dangerous job based on this? Likeliness of dying while working. So I'm going to give you four uh, selections and you can pick which one. So most dangerous job based on likeliness to die while working. A, police officer. B, Farmer, C, policeman, D, fisherman. Most dangerous job. I'm just like going to go with the fisherman because he's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, kind of kind of a little different, but also like watching Deadliest Catch. <laughs> People get fucked up on there. <laughs> what is the difference between police officer and policeman? Oh, maybe you said policeman, the same thing twice. Policeman, police officer. Oh, I, the, the first, I meant fireman, sorry. Fireman. Okay. Fire okay. That's my I thought, fault. Fireman. I thought that was part of the game. <laughs> yeah, uh, me too. Like, <laughs> I was like, see, that was <laughs> unintentional. That was unintentional. But yeah, I'm trying to mess you up not playing. But fireman, sorry, not policeman and police fireman and police officer. God. I'd say. Damn, I don't know about fireman. Uh you know what? I'm gonna just go. Damn. Fireman. <laughs> okay. You ready for the answer? Drum yeah. roll. Fisherman. Hey. But get, wait, you ready for this catcher though? Number two would have been what? What do you think? Farmer. Farmer. Mm. <laughs> okay. But what, why did your why? brain do that? Think about this. I thought of fires, bro. Exactly. <laughs> and that's called availability bias. Uh -huh. Your brain goes the most relevant. Because what do you see on the news more? Because he made a good point. Daily is catch. That's why he thought that. <laughs> Most people think fishermen, they think on the pier with your granddad. Do, yeah. do, 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 do. And you're just chilling. <laughs> you're probably not going to die there. Yeah. But in the rough seas where the waves are 40, 50 feet high and the boat could get flipped over, capsized, mm. that's dangerous. So mm. it's the most likely because drowning or getting injured. Oh, and then yeah. with farmer-wise, number two, people think 
old McDonald bailing hay. But think about all the machines they use that are high power, could grind you up in a second. Crushed up Dangerous. by a tractor. Yeah. Exactly. Now, firemen and police aren't too far off, but they're not the top because we think fire, you probably get seriously injured mm-hmm. or burned badly or even die. Mm-hmm. And in police, we think guns. And guns kill. Mm-hmm. But the likeness of a police drawing, my dad was a police for 32 years and he forced me knock on wood, didn't have to do anything nice. like to that extent. Yeah. But some people do. But it's not as relevant because on what do we see on the news every day? Mm-hmm. Shooting of officers or officer shooting, officer shooting, officer shooting. Yeah. But guess what? That's the minority, but it's a big event to us because you're not checking random newspaper in small mm-hmm. nowhere town. Huh, no shootings today. Oh, no shoot. No, you see the CNN or Fox News uh-huh. and it spreads. Yeah. So our yeah. brain tries to make sense. So you thought firemen because it makes sense. That's mm-hmm. not an illogical choice. So bringing this full circle, I know I, I took it to job occupations, but when that athlete, or even just in life, when we make bad decisions, is because our brain's just trying to make the quickest sense of it, and this messes us up sometimes. I'm kind of curious about this. When it comes to, like, the Stroop test, and I know that, like, you have the added stressor of having an athlete doing a drill and moving so that there's more moving parts, but is there any benefits to, like, having an app that can you can then do these? Well, I know you're not stressed because maybe you're sitting, doing it, or standing, but is there a benefit to that? Mm -hmm. So I actually do use an app version. So the one you saw is the one I created for those drills. Mm -hmm. But I have an app version that I utilize, and it measures their reaction time, their variance, their consistency, their speed. So I know not just how fast, because most of these apps, there's a lot of them out there. But Mm -hmm. the ones I use are more uh, specific to those, because we think about like statistics. We want to know exactly what variable made them better or what variable made them worse. I even use HRV, heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at a lot of things, and this is stuff like, Obviously, IG only shows you clips, but this stuff I look back on my end. So when I'm talking to a client, because I work with all populations, athletes, I have a, a, a client with dementia, but I use the same methodology. So if I know how fast they are, that's cool. But if I have two different people and I see who's better, the next thing I'm looking at is how accurate. Okay, they're both accurate, 100% accuracy, cool. Now, variance, that's my favorite because variance shows me how consistent. So you think of like, if I do a task together, and that's actually right there. So yeah, so to do tasks together where... I see how consistent they are. If they're more consistent, say 12% of the time they deviate from their normal score, mm-hmm. that's good. I want to see under 20% for that. But if they're like 40, 50%, you don't even have to know stats to get this is, what would you want to only be good at half the time? 10% uh, or 90% sounds better than 50%, right? Yeah. So that's what variance tells me because I know if they do this said task, when I change the variable, let's say I make it quicker or I add more external things, do they get faster do they get less consistent mm-hmm. and then i can say okay they didn't get less consistent let me add that's just like adding bands or chains mm-hmm. right i and i used to be a shrimp coach way back in the day before well i was doing it simultaneously as learning my mental coaching and psychology degrees but basically i look at it the same way adding bands and chains or boards or whatever it is changes the angles changes the resistance at a certain load mm-hmm. or a certain height it's the same thing with the, the mental stuff you have to change the variables what leads to bad decisions like uh say something like with food you know, somebody knows they want to be in better shape. They try to dedicate themselves to it. They spend a lot of time exercising. They do, you know, I don't know. They do, they do like 80% of it and then they self-sabotage. What do you think leads to that? Self-sabotage. That's an interesting one. I think just if we go with self-sabotage in general, people, I call it beating to the punch. It's easier to say, I messed up because of me versus saying, well, times got hard or someone got in my way. Because who going back to that control, who wants to give away their control? So it's easy to say, oh, I, I fell off. I know I was eating bad and they, they beat themselves to the punch. So self sabotage But when it comes to like diets, food is a very interesting thing, right? Because from a physical standpoint, it actually does something to us from a mental side. Like there's there's different hormones yeah, and receptors, works, yeah. like leptin. And it's like, are we full? Are we not full? And yeah. if we get into the nutrition side, it's like some foods have us calorically filled but not nutrient wise and vice versa nutrient filled but not caloric so i know it's cliche but you have to have a balanced diet because it's going to fulfill both sides because i can eat all the healthy nutrient dense stuff i want but what happens at the end of the week when i'm in a negative five thousand deficit and i'm starving i do that one little i'm gonna go to insert famous fast food <laughs> chain taco whatever i won't plug anybody accidentally mm-hmm. but basically you're going to binge. Yeah. So now you set yourself up for failure because- I'm just going to get a burger. And then you're like, ah, I should probably get a chocolate shake too. And then, then you <laughs> get that. Ah, so. I bump pie. the fries up a little bit mm-hmm. size-wise. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, why deprive yourself? So it's not saying 
okay, eat a, a little junk every day. But it's like, okay, if you have to satisfy yourself a little bit with a little more color, it doesn't have to be junk, but eating a little more. Because I think when people think diet, they think just restriction. Yes. And that's anything. It's not even just uh, food, but even behaviors. You don't have to stop. You just need to dial it back, depending obviously what it is. So that way you have room because when you get into, like, say, the dopamine response again, it's like you set yourself up for here, but then you hit here. And guess what? Your brain's like, well, this isn't working. Let's raise or lower that down. And it's like, okay. And then you get lower. And guess what? Now you're pr literally programmed to be less than what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. How do you walk an athlete through, you know, you kind of start talking with them back and forth. You realize they're not really doing some of the stuff that you're suggesting. Maybe they're not really doing some of the stuff that their other coaches are suggesting. Um, they're frustrated. They're like, I'm not really going anywhere. Like they're, they're getting mad. Like their competition's coming up. They're just like kind of flustered. Like how do you kind of walk them through some of that? How do you maybe get them back on track? So I'll ask them like what's been going on because it's all, I know it sounds so simplistic, but I guess the first step is always what even led us to this point in the first place. Cause we just go to a solution. Great. I give you something, like you said, something to do, but you're not even ready to hear that solution yet. So if they say something like, well, I just feel overwhelmed because I have, like, especially with MMA, I have three, you got jujitsu, mm -hmm. sparring, maybe wrestling, kickbox, whatever it is. So they might be overwhelmed. So if I hear them say, well, I just feel like I can't keep up with the workload. Now, I don't control that. Obviously, the, the physical or the skill mm -hmm. coaches play their role. And some, depending on the client, I do have some interaction with both. Some, I have zero. So I can't change that. Control the controllables, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll let them know, like, okay, what can be changed? Can you dial back the load? Can you change this day? And then that could be the easiest solution. It's like, oh, we shifted the days. Now I can focus now because you're going to fail if you're already overwhelmed and you're not even going to be able to change it up. So how do I get better if I have to keep doing the thing that's messing me up? And you can speak, you both can speak to this better than me from the physical side. They're going to end up overtraining, which is going to affect their central nervous system and it's going to affect their mindset. So it's just a full circle. Yeah. So you have a hot date coming up and you look in your closet and all you see are the old ugly clothes that you usually wear and you're going to wear tonight. <laughs> it's time to end that, guys. That's why we've partnered with Viore Clothing because they have some amazing athleisure clothes that you can wear in the gym when working out, but also clothes that you can wear on a date or during Hanukkah, or whatever. You can wear these clothes wherever, and they feel amazing. Some of our favorites are the Ponter Performance line, which has Dreamnet fabric, which literally feels so soft on your skin. But they also have this. This is the Rise Tee, also soft, also feels nice and fits great. And they have a lot of amazing clothes that you need to check out to step your fashion game up. We're trying to help you out. Andrew, where can they get it? Yeah, absolutely. You guys got to head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I.com slash power project, and you'll automatically receive 20% off your order. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What did you notice from like Dustin, you know, you work with Dustin Poirier on the mental side of things. So when you started implementing some of this with him, um, what's the story behind that? And for someone who's already a professional athlete, a professional fighter, how did it benefit him? So with Dustin, he... I only, like I said, I hate sounding cliche, but he's a very rare, not rare, but his case was so different because I work with athletes across the board, police, even all types of clientele. So I've seen so many different varieties. So when I worked with him, the first thing I noticed was he was receptive. So in personality, there's something called open to experience. So that's someone who's more likely to be open to different ideas, inquisitive about certain things. So with him, he questioned a lot, not, not in a negative way, but more so I want to understand more. So that right there showed me like I can throw different things at him because and some athletes are probably quite the opposite. They're probably like, what's this guy going to tell exactly. me that's new to me? Like I'm already performing at such a high level. Exactly. Especially <laughs> when I'm not in their field. My background is like as a personal, as an athlete, athlete was football, track and baseball. So fighting, that's a whole different beast. So from a guy who's never been in a a, stru a structured fight, we'll keep that on the low, but basically <laughs> I can't really speak to that. It's a different uh, atmosphere. So yeah. obviously they have to trust me. So I get a lot of that, but I guess I get some acceptance from the ones who aren't like Dustin, at least because I come recommend it. So that at least gives them the opening. But with Dustin, I think we mentioned this earlier. That was my, f my first time meeting him was uh, Fox Sports was there to film with Phil and Phil brought me in and literally my first time meeting him was on that. So talk about trust. Not only was he allowing this guy he's never met before to work with him, he had to do, or didn't have to, but he chose to do it where the world saw it. So that said something different right there. Off, So I knew from that point on, I could throw different things. And as we progress, I could say, hey, does this work? How do you feel? And he is literally the, the template because he was one of the first major, major athletes I worked with. So his standard became my standard for everyone else under. 
So you could be a, a eight year old soccer player. You could be a police. You could be a soccer mom. Dustin Poirier. He was the standard. <laughs> they, they ask me. They'll say, "What is his scores? Or what is his times? Or what, what does he think on these things?" Yeah. So it's like, and it's not necessarily to be like a who's better standpoint. It's more so if I don't think he'll do it, I'm not doing it to anyone else because. With him, there's a lot on the line here. It's not just the money, obviously, but it's like his reputation, his physical being. So it's like I wouldn't put him in any parameters or status with my task or anything or even the mindset stuff like that I would think would harm him. Yeah. And that's something in any practice, right? Even with doctors, they say do no yeah. harm. So I think the same way because if this is a detriment to him, I'm not doing my job. Obviously, getting faster, more efficient, thinking better under pressure is the end goal. But I want to know if he been receptive to doing that in the first place. You tell all your people, you're like, this is Dustin's favorite exercise. <laughs> I do that sometimes. Andrew, what you got brewing over there? <laughs> uh, let me find it. Oh, it's a uh, post. Here it is. Oh, I just want you to speak on it because this one, this one's big. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Can you please speak on this? So for people listening, it says hindsight, foresight, and insight. And the hindsight's perfect vision. Foresight's a little blurry. Insight is very blurry. And we talk a lot about like self-talk and then mm -hmm. like self-belief and then also manifesting. But I just wanted you to go a little bit deeper on insight and what you mean with this. Yeah, that's one of my most popular. I actually reposted that from a few years back because I did a video about it. So hindsight, right? That's basically knowing what's already transpired. I could have did that. I should have did that. What if? We can see that perfectly, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously it already happened, so it's easy to call back to it. Yeah. So that's the, you see the eye chart, so it's clear. Now the second one, foresight, that's what could happen? What could I do? What could be? What should I do? So we're good at planning things out, whether it's positive or negative. Some people can say, oh, I'm going to go on a trip, or I'm going to win a championship, or going to get married, whatever it is. Or they'll do the opposite. Man, I don't know if I'm going to win. I might fail. So whatever it is, they can see that slightly clear, but it's not perfect because we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's still a, a question mark. Yeah. And then the last one, <laughs> kind of ironic, insight. The one thing that we have direct momentary control over is the blurriest. And it's usually because we're so busy on what already happened and what could happen. So we just ignore what's happening in the moment. And it's like, it's not saying you shouldn't have hindsight or, or foresight. You should, because in order to get better right now, I have to reflect on things I did wrong. Mm -hmm. But how much are you emphasizing it? That's the question I'll ask a client or someone. If I'm only lingering on the loss or only lingering on the mess up, how much can that get me better after, say, 24 hours? I say the first day or two, linger on it a little bit because you want to reflect. But after that, let it go and rebuild. And then with foresight, you can't control outcomes. I know that sounds ridiculous because if you say, of course I can. If I work hard and just do my best, I'm going to win. So, oh, I'll ask, do you win every race or every meet or every fight or every job opportunity? No. Nope. Oh, so you choose to lose. No. So <laughs> what did you really control? Obviously, going back to the circle of control, you have influence. My hard work can influence the outcome, whether it's the referee, whether it's the, the boss at the new job I'm trying to get. You have to have influence, but we can't completely see it. And then insight, that should be the, the clear as the hindsight because that's the only thing you can directly in this moment change. So yeah. that's that one. I, I, I like that a lot. I think it'd be helpful to make it more, you can make it more clear by asking questions. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that in the gym a little bit. Um, rather than, you know, rather than thinking about all the shit that you didn't do correctly with hindsight, you can just turn those into question marks and say, I, I wonder how I could, mm -hmm. could handle that better. I wonder how I could progress a little faster. Maybe I'll start asking my coach. Maybe I'll ask my mentor. Maybe I'll ask my teacher how I can do a little bit better. How can I get my grade up? How can I... All these things. And it just gives you a lot more options when you are inquisitive, which sounds like Dustin Poirier was doing with you, um, he, he, to gain that knowledge so that he can have a more clear picture of everything that was going to happen. Yeah, and I actually had a little thing I do when I do workshops. I call it the diamond mindset because, you know, he's a diamond. And he had a series of things he did on top of, you know, being inquisitive, open-minded. But he also always spoke in a, like you said, ask the questions he spoke like that it wasn't necessarily like guaranteed he's he's open with this he said this in interviews uh numerous times on like he does feel that like that doubt or whatever it's just like I, but i know i'm the best man for this job he's not better than me in the sense of i know what i bring so that's that balance of confidence versus people who have false confidence like he's not saying it out of i'm the best it's saying is like i did what it takes to be the best and he talks it like whether i'm hanging around him when we used to work more frequently during when like he's training for other things like sparring whatever you'll see him saying things relevant to being better not necessarily dominating in the sense of i got this automatically but it's like building that mindset of these are the words these are the thoughts that go into 
being dominant and being better. So that that has to be practiced like any skill. I hate to keep using a physical reference, but it's very similar. I can't get stronger at a squat or a bench or whatever unless I do a squat or a bench. Mm-hmm. I can't just hope it gets better because I, I want it. But with this, some some reason, it goes out the window. And I actually have an analogy I use for this um, because I look at it as there's there's passive aspects of going about like mental performance or mental health, and there's more active, just like with physical. So passive's like, you know, the apps like uh, Calm, mm-hmm. yeah. Headspace, Box Breathing, things like that, meditation, mindfulness, all great. Definitely useful. I get my clients to do it. Definitely something I personally practice. But that's passive. So imagine in fitness or strength conditioning, if I only do mobility work, I only do stretches, okay, I'm flexible. I can get into a position, but how resilient is my body in mm-hmm. the actual load? Mm-hmm. That's where the actual strength conditioning stuff comes in. So same thing with mental. Okay, you do the box breathing. You do the mindful work. You're, you're doing the self-talk task. Great, we need that because that builds that foundation. But how do you hold up when there's an actual mental stressor or cognitive stressor in front of you? And that's where those drills we talked about earlier and they showed on the screen, that's where that can be trained because – I always break it down to people is we can see in real time because it's a good thing they know how our brain processes and handles stress from a neuroscience side. We need that. But we can see in real time from some of these tasks, how do you actually hold up when things go wrong or you mess up and how do you recalibrate or not? You know, some people, when they look at, because you were mentioning the big five personality and how sometimes you'll have an, you, you have an athlete do a big five and then you can see how it's reflected in the Stroop test. Like they fail and they start fucking getting anxious mm-hmm. and stuff, right? So- Have you seen, through working with an athlete for a prolonged period of time, have you seen their personality change when it comes to competition? Because anxiety isn't necessarily fully bad. Sometimes anxious people plan a lot of things out. They plan for every single situation. They're very particular. They they can be very detailed. But sometimes that anxiety can cripple a person when it comes to competing, right? So there's a good and bad on anxiety. But have you seen somebody be able to, I guess, flip their anxiety when it comes to being in a, a like a competition setting, even though they're still maybe an anxious type of person? Mm-hmm. So yeah, so with anxiety, like you said, anxiety just means we're getting ready, right? From a physical response, fight or flight, our yeah. heart rate increases, our breathing. So it's letting us know there's something imminent about to happen. So mm-hmm. you need it to be ready. Yeah. But like you said, the bad side is when you go too far. So someone who has more of a or neurotic or emotionality, what they call it now, personality, they're more prone to it because personality is all about a spectrum of where you fall. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily anxious, not anxious, extroverted, introverted. It's more so where do you fall? So a person who's high on emotionality or anxiety, Mm -hmm. they're more likely to default to that. So going to your point, can it change? Yes, but you have to be very active in it. Mm -hmm. It's not like, okay, I did it once or twice. I was calm here. I'm good. No, you have to be conscious because it's personality. People always ask, can it be changed? And I was talking about my mentor earlier, and he says this a lot. He's a personality psychologist. He said yes and no. It's more so no because we have this default mode that that's who we are. We revert to this. Think about it. Perfect example, if I threw this ball to you real quick. Yep. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. So that worked out perfectly. <laughs> so he caught it with which hand? Right. It's right. Yeah. So what just happened there? His default mode, he caught it with the hand that's most dominant. Now you can argue He's on the right side. I usually do that when I do surprise people. I come from the front side, so you have to mm-hmm. choose. Mm-hmm. But the point is, your default mode is what personality is. Can you catch with your left hand? Sure, definitely. But how often do you use it? And the same thing with personality. If I'm not actively trying to be less emotional, less anxious, then I'm not going to be able to do it when it counts in a competition. So you have to practice. So going back to all the drills we do, mm-hmm. I will coach them up in between sets and say, hey, I noticed." You didn't use your left hand one time, or I noticed you were holding your breath, or I noticed you were saying, F you, mother, whatever. And my biggest thing, and I practice what I preach, I've been like this since I was an athlete, and now that I'm in this, I try to keep it going. Yeah. I should not know if you're doing good, and I should not know if you're doing bad. Let's use the late, great Kobe Bryant. There's a scene he did, an uh, inbound pass. It's for one of his most prominent, yeah, with, uh, yeah, before I up. was it Matt like, Barnes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ooh, he, was he, cold. he was guarding Matt Barnes, and uh-huh. Matt Barnes threw it real hard, like inches away from his face, he didn't move. Could he have been nervous? That's a ball, but I'd hit him in the head, of course. But we wouldn't know, and we shouldn't know. Yeah, I've had yeah. athletes and clients of all sorts, even police. They'll come in. I'll know every aspect of their fear, their frustration. Mm-hmm. I should know, especially in those jobs. I shouldn't know that. Yeah. Should it happen? It's going to happen. Like you said, anxiety, worry, it just lets you know something important or something necessary is occurring. Mm-hmm. But the next step is where you respond. So yeah. it can be changed. It just has to be very intentional. Yeah. We talk a lot on the show about habits. And, you know, people like forming habits and it takes a lot of time 
for some people to develop habits and to start to steer their life in a good direction. What are some techniques or what are some things you usually communicate to somebody on how they can start to develop some habits to start to head in the right direction? So the simplest thing, and it's so such low-hanging fruit, but not a lot of people do it, have a routine. And when I say routine, not necessarily like a ritual, because a lot of people argue rituals. I always say routines, not rituals, because how I look at a ritual and how I define it is more so there's an outcome tied to it. So it's like if I put on my lucky jersey or if I do this chant, mm-hmm. now this will happen. That's where I see the difference with a ritual. With a routine is more so these steps prepare me to let me get ready for said occurrence or event or whatever it is. So a performance routine like in the psychology world is having maybe two or three steps that you take and you do it repetitively so it's the same as, as it can be every time yeah. before the event or the activity. And I use this when I do big proposals. I had a proposal with um, a city, Miami Gardens, a few months ago, which was a big opportunity for me. And I, I, I ran it all through my head. And the routine for me consists of I take a few deep breaths, like three or four, like box breathing style, and then I'll close my eyes and run through maybe two to three minutes of the the interview or the proposal, whatever it is, see it first as the way I want it to go, see it as going not the way I want it to go, and then bring it together with both because what happens in real life? You never know which way. Going back to that hindsight, foresight, insight, mm-hmm. I never say get rid of the hindsight or get rid of the foresight, but let's see it. And um, I think Dr. Huberman did a podcast recently on visualization, and I, I was so glad to see that because – we talked about this a little bit before, the, the the unofficial West Coast, East Coast beef between neuroscience and psychology. Yeah. And for him to do that, I like that until told feel this is bridging that gap that, that I'm trying to do myself personally because it goes hand in hand. So visualizing and seeing it. So a routine should consist of one, being in the moment. So that's why I do the breathing. And two, having a visual aspect of what you want to happen as well as what might go wrong. And then three, have a cue, could be a word. And I know with lifters, you do this, like, it could be a physical cue, like, slap your hip, snap your finger, whatever. But it should be a cue that says, when I say this or do this, it's time to go. And then just reflect on, where's my mindset? Because it doesn't mean you're going to be perfectly calm now. It Mm -hmm. just means, I know where I'm at. So when you do said task or sport or interview or hot date, whatever it is, you know, okay, that's where I was when it happened. So when you go back and say, so how did you feel when you hit that game runner winning home run? I don't know. I just did it. No. We want to say, well, I was a little nervous at first. I was calm. And then I just spiked up, and when I saw the picture, I knew it was my time. Or vice versa. Yeah, I think I wasn't ready, but I still executed. Whatever it was, you at least were mindful. Because we, we use the word mindful a lot, mm-hmm. but it's usually just freely having your mind roam. And that, that's not mindfulness. Mindfulness should be able to identify what's occurring mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah, I think it's interesting if you think of, uh, like, routine. I think you're always trying to, especially nowadays, because so many people talk about, like, their morning routine their cold plunge and their sauna and the different things that people might do, the breathing. Um, But routine doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You know, if you look at, you know, Marshawn Lynch was big on like eating Skittles before a game. (laughs) Kobe Bryant notoriously ate pepperoni pizza and orange and grape soda. So it, 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 it's a uh, highly individual, exactly what someone does, but like maybe those guys found those foods, which most coaches and most <laughs> nutrition people would be like, ah, well, maybe we should change this. But I've, I've worked with a lot of great athletes, having them come through here at super training. And I've tried to change some of their uh, routine. I tried to change a little bit of what they were doing. And it was a mistake because they had a, a particular way, a particular a uh, particular way that they would move, a particular way they would psych up for a lift, a bunch of different things. And sometimes asking someone to calm down that gets really hyped up isn't a great idea. Sometimes vice versa, it's not mm-hmm. a great idea. Each person's just a little different. So the people listening, I, you know, I don't want you to go out and eat a bunch of pepperoni pizza, but <laughs> I do think that your routine can be unique to you. Yep. You, exactly. you can find something that feels good for you and that works well for you. I agree with that 100% because in a track world, we used to always talk about this when Usain Bolt took to the scene. People criticize his form. He, mm-hmm. he was, he's long, he's six four, six five. That's not typical for a sprinter. And people say, but what if his mechanics were like this? I would argue, I'm not a track expert per se. I ran it to a decent level, but <laughs> it probably would have maybe made him slower because yeah. that's how he's mechanically, like, over his career ran, and that's how he got to where he is. And the same thing with your athletes. If this is what's been working, long as – I guess the main takeaway should be is – are they in the moment? If they're in the moment doing all that stuff, let it be. Now, if it's like, I don't know, coach, I just did it and they have no idea and it's just something to do to pass time, that's when I would kind of not say change it, but mm-hmm. like entertain like, hmm, what, what could go differently? 
So is this something that could help an athlete? Like you always hear people talk about the flow, right? Or being in that moment. Is this something that can help an athlete being able to better access being in the moment and getting the fuck out of their head? Yeah, well, with flow state, that comes back to, like, say, managing the stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, there's something called the inverted U hypothesis. Are you familiar Never with that? Never heard of that. So you've probably done it without even knowing it, or mm -hmm. it, it, it plays a role. So the theory is basically, think of an upside down U. Yeah. So on one side is low arousal, and when we say arousal, we mean, like, ready for action, not that other arousal. Mm -hmm. I know we, you've talked about that on this podcast before. <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the other side is high arousal. Yeah. So obviously, just like everything, a spectrum, you don't want to completely be low, but you don't actually want to complete uh, perfect. So you don't want to be completely high either mm -hmm. because you see the best performance is somewhere in that middle range. So mm -hmm. when we talk about flow state, that's what they're actually referring to because here, if you get even to the neuroscience of it, you're in a brainwave state, which allows you to be active in that moment and to be clear because the best performance are the ones where you're just focused on the task at hand, like I said, being yep. in the moment. Because when it comes to say cognition, the more load you put on your brain, the less focus you have mm -hmm. on what's happening are able to handle because if you look at the high stress level if we're there that's like let's go let's go come on let's get let's get it you said some people need that so that's why i argue know your athlete or know your client whatever it is but more than likely they could be a little uh, lower so if they're not the complete right side they could be maybe a little outside that zone so it's not necessarily perfect i know we we're talking about lifting and i said that when i hit my biggest squat i hit 525 i actually put on um hotel california hey that's not red a hot chili peppers right Hmm? Is that Red Hot Chili Peppers? Oh, no, the Eagles. The Eagles, oh. Think okay. about Californication. That's my jam, too. That's what That's I was my thinking. Jam Californication, okay. <laughs> I've messed with both, but the lift before, <laughs> yeah. I was listening to Rick Ross hustling when I hit a uh, four, <laughs> 485 or something like that, whatever the jump was. Yeah. So that was the lift before. Okay. So when I hit the PR, it was, a, it was a song that isn't an upbeat song, but I knew for me in that moment, people were like, why you want this? You just went from more of a mm -hmm. crunk, upbeat I just dated myself, huh? So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, hey, it is what it is. So I told myself, this is where I want to be. I mm -hmm. want it to be a little calmer because I've never had that much weight on me. And I always have this theory too, regardless if it's 100 pounds or a million pounds, it's always going to be the higher one in my head. Yeah. That's, and I look at that in life, whether it's an easy task, going back to the Kobe thing, I should not know whether you think it's difficult or hard, it's uh, frustrating or not. It should be, uh, ag you should be agnostic to it. You shouldn't see it either way. Does it mean you don't acknowledge it? No, that's not what I'm saying. You can see it as, dang, this is a lot. But it shouldn't, because when you make it outward, guess what? Those motor functions that go with it become real time. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to think it. Obviously, the neurons are firing. The patterns are forming. That's not preferable. But once you make an action with it, now it's becoming an actual dynamic. People say, you talk about manifesting, right? Mm -hmm. That's where that term comes in. They say, speak it to existence, right? Uh, they call it the, the Pygmalion effect, so, you know, the story of Pygmalion from um, the Greek society, and basically he saw a statue that he thought was beautiful. He wanted to come to life. So mm -hmm. he wished and the guys uh, made it come to life. So that same concept is like when you speak things to existence, you eventually, you know, the self-fulfilling prophecy, it becomes what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So you got to make sure you don't verbalize or bring, say, energy. Like the, you heard of the secret, right? That's one of the most yeah, popular yeah, yeah. things with it. So they got some things right. It gets a lot of criticism, but they got some things right because in the brain, there's something called the reticular activation system. <laughs> So you that a lot from Tony Robbins. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so the Raz, right? Yeah. So I always say the car thing, like if you get a new car, you see it everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you see it everywhere, it's not because sales in the new, I don't know what you're driving, Honda Civic or uh -huh. Ferrari, I don't know. But basically, they're everywhere because now your brain says it's relevant. So going back to the point of self-talk and all that stuff, now it's like, okay, if this is relevant to me, my Raz, my brain is going to say, only search for those things and you overlook. They did an experiment that I showed in my class, it's hilarious. And it's a bear, or a, no, a monkey, a guy in a monkey suit, mm -hmm. and they're passing a basketball around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they say, count the passes. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, 12. And they're like, no, it's 13. No, it's 15. So I said, wait, but did you see the dancing monkey? And they're like, wait, what? And then we rewind it back. And while they're passing the ball, literally a, a guy who's like, these six feet tall walks through, starts popping and locking, <laughs> dancing, doing a running man and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and no, no one, one sees, sees it. <laughs> Why? Because you weren't even focused on that. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it seems so like like crazy, but the brain, the mind, it, it, I, that's why I love this stuff. It really has no bounds. And that's why I tag Mind, Body, One as a way to bring it all together. Mm -hmm. It's the flow state the same as the zone? Yeah, that's just the, like the Jordan flow. Like Jordan getting in the zone back the in the day? The flow is the scientific term for the yeah. zone. 
Yeah. Power Project family, your normal shoes are making you weak. This is why we partner with Vivo Barefoot Shoes because they have a wide toe box, they're flat and they're flexible. So with every single step you're taking, if you're taking a 10 minute walk outside or when you're working out in the gym, your feet are able to do what they're supposed to do in this shoe. They have tons of options for hiking, running, training in the gym, chilling and relaxing, casual shoes for if you're out on a date. You need to check them out. And Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash power project. And you guys will receive 15% off your order automatically. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash power project. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What about if, uh, I don't know, some, some doubt creeps into an athlete's uh, thoughts? How do you coach them to kind of try to block that? So, go with another analogy. So I sound like a selfish question. It is very much a selfish. <laughs> hey, question. I'm fine with that. Let's do it. We have an on-site session. Let's go. And the so cool thing is, the sofa. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it hasn't happened. I'm just you know making sure down the road if something comes up, I want to make sure I have some uh, you know some weaponry to, to fight back. He's about to do his first jujitsu mm-hmm. match coming. Oh, perfect. So yeah. this is an unofficial mm-hmm. session console. Thank you, I'll sir. I'll be you later. No, <laughs> build the podcast and it's all good. <laughs> nah, not, definitely not. I'm happy just to be here, guys. But basically, you said. How do you get rid of or stop it? That's the first mistake. Because when we suppress thoughts, we tend to think of them more. So like with basketball players, I had an athlete, the classic thing of bricking a free throw when the game is online, or even when it's not, you say, don't miss, don't miss, don't miss. Even though you say don't, what's still in that phrase? <laughs> miss. Miss. So don't get rid of the thought by trying to suppress it because there's something called the White Bear Experiment that was done at Harvard University in the, the mid-80s, a guy named Daniel Wegner. He passed, I think, a few years ago, unfortunately, but he studied uh, numerous things. And one of the studies he did was on thought suppression because he wondered why does things get stuck in your head? Think about that song you hate, Mm -hmm. but eventually start jamming because (laughs) it can't go away. You try to suppress it. So what they did in the experiment with the white bear, they said, okay, sit in this chair, just talk to uh, whatever thoughts come to your mind, just say them out loud. So it might be like, yeah, I'm going to go get some food later with my friends, maybe watch a movie, blah, blah, blah. They said, if you think about a white bear, hit this bell right next to the, the seat. Ding. So they saw it. Kind of infrequent, but the second condition was don't think about the white bear. And what they saw was they hit it just as frequent, in some cases, more frequent with the don't think task. Mm-hmm. Because when you say don't think about it, your mind says don't think about it. But oops, you just thought about it. Ding. <laughs> so going back to self-doubt, mm-hmm. it's not to say negate the thought and get rid of it or just ignore it. It's more so reframe it. So using the white bear instead of white bear, purple flamingos. Now that's crazy for that example but for your example if the thought let's say is if you don't mind sharing you have a thought that you might think about a lot that be negating your performance oh just um i'll just i'll say the competitor passing my guard and not being able to retain my guard again so let's say the thought is why can i keep keep them in guard so instead of questioning it in that phrasing say it in a more productive i don't use the word positive because positive is subjective but Mm -hmm. productive that means it ends with you doing the outcome you prefer so change it to a, a productive self-talk that would be something that ends in what you're trying to do. So instead of saying, don't let them X, Y, Z, or mm-hmm. don't do this, say the new thought of reframing it to what you're trying to do. So like going with the don't miss example, all net, buckets, whatever it is. So something simple as that, because what happens is not just like speaking to existence or, or manifesting. It's more so what happens. The neuron pathways get stronger with the productive outcome and they get weaker with the, the negative or the unproductive outcome because the memories don't really go away. We, we, we have memories from what, 20, 30, 40 years ago, whatever your age is. So basically it's more how uh, relevant or relevant they are in your mind. So practicing the thoughts that are more productive will be once again, default that, that catching that ball with your default mode. Mm-hmm. You want your default mode to be more accessible to the helpful thoughts. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. I really appreciate that. No, nah, this is, Power of the mind, right? Yeah, absolutely. Seems so simple, but when I talk to people, and that's why I love educating because it's really what I do because I'm not a therapist. I did go that route for my doctoral before I dropped out like Kanye, but I'm like, can I say that? <laughs> I know he's canceled right now. Is he, is he canceled still? He's still I, alive. I, I, I hope not. Do you still listen to his music? Oh, I do. Yeah. I still okay. can't get past the first two albums. Like, those are my favorites. because you're old, dog. I know, and Got I'm okay with that. Mind. He but likes not The dropout? Like college dropout. College dropout. Yeah, like not, college dropout. Nas and Hit Boy are on a really good run right now, though. Wait, really? Nah, it's back? Dude, okay. Oh, dude, it's like a, that out. like a gang star type run. You know, like him and Hit Boy, like very guru premiere. It's really good right now. Well, I'll put that on my, my playlist. Yes, please do. It's good. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, uh, the beef you were talking about with people in your field? Because you were mentioning like, <laughs> no, you're a guy, we, we, I like you a lot because you're a guy who takes a lot of this stuff and then you apply 
apply it. It's not just based off of like what studies say, but you were mentioning some stuff about some beef. I'm curious. So I guess I'll be an extra with it, but it's not like a beef per se, but there is a kind of butting of the heads, I would say, in the industries. And it's not just me saying this. You ask anyone in either field. So yeah. there's so many subfields of, I call it the brain and behavior science, because that umbrella includes psychology, neuroscience, clinical psychology, those mm -hmm. people who are therapists, uh, cognitive psychologists who more so on process. So it's so many sub facets, right? But if we just go simply psychology versus the neuroscience versus the clinical, we'll break it into those three terms. So like I said, this is not no going back to the old school, East Coast, West Coast type of thing. <laughs> but basically, it's like the, the, the applied psychologist, someone who's more like me, mm -hmm. I'm taking what I learned from the literature and creating my drills or creating my coaching style from what I understand. I'm all, I read, feel, we talk about this all the time. He's like, dang, you always reading articles because I want to be like, I understand this enough that I could go sit, not maybe fully sit at a conference from the other side, but I can at least hold my own. Yeah. You no, know, I'm not a know-it-all, but if I can hold my own, I want to be able to do that. And the other side, I want to be able to say, if you're a client of any demographic, it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I work with law enforcement, military, kids, dementia. And it's not because I want to be a jack of all trades. I actually have an acronym for, you know, jack of all trades. I, I call it Joe of all trades. Mm -hmm. So jack is just average common knowledge of all trades. Yeah. A Joe is what you want to be. I call it, that's what I call it. Uh, uh, justifiably optimal experience of all trades. Okay. So I know it's a mouthful, but that's how I look at it because I can't be good at everything. But can I be optimal? Sure, because... There's some things I'm better. I'm more better on the applied psychology than I am on the neuro side. I will never claim that because I got people I talk to say, hey, what do you think that are big in the neuro side? Mm -hmm. And they have their two cents. But going back to the point is, it's not necessarily a beef or a divide. It's just more so people have their set in their ways. And since I didn't finish my, my, my doctorate, I didn't have to do a dissertation, which when you specialize directly in your, it's your research. It's, it's not that you're, you obviously cite other sources, but you're the world's for, foremost expert on whatever topic you pick. So I think the fact that I went so far and didn't finish and also just having just crazy life experiences that put me in some compromised position where I had to think and be creative, it allowed me to see it from different views so where I can walk in both worlds and be open to both sides or all three sides because the clinical side, that's more so therapy. We talk about mental health is key and yeah. I agree. Therapy has its place, but only about 10 to 12% of the population, give or take, will succumb to a, a disorder. So what are we doing for their 90, 88%? That's, that's everyone. That's the majority, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I come in because if you have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, you go to the clinical side. That's where you need to be. But if you're just having a tough time in sport, tough time with your, your family life, you just want to perform better and not stress as much. Yeah. That's where you get someone like myself who's going to bridge that gap because that's a, it's like it's a day-to-day -day thing. We're not going to be in this mood or this, this point all the time. So I think the discrepancy is not necessarily they don't like each other or beefing. It's more so that they have to be open that they all tie in. That's why I approach it this way because I borrow from the neural world. I dabble in that. It's not my forefront, but I got to know some of that stuff. The clinical world, that was my original major. So I did up to the point where right before you start seeing practicum uh, clients. So I did like mock sessions with my classmates so I had to get some of that experience and it helps me a lot because now I got to look at it as how do I motivationally interview you and understand why are you even coming to me in the first place and where do we go next? Yeah. Then the applied side says, make this make sense in real life. Whether it's Dustin Poirier, someone's grandmother, my eight-year-old daughter, Tiana, whoever it is, it's, they're gonna, it's not going to look different as far as methodology, but it will look different in application. So that's why I think there's a divide. They just got to like shake hands with each other and say, you know what? Let me take some of this. Oh, like a, a dinner table, right? And mm -hmm. a picnic. They invite us to cookout. Like, let's get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, why do you think so many people are experiencing depression, anxiety, loneliness, things like that? I think the world evolved too fast because I used to, so another part of my journey, I used to be a history teacher and I taught middle school history, U.S. history, American Damn. government. And I got fired, or not fired, laid off because of budget cuts. Mm. And I just had my daughter, Tiana, who was three months at the time. Oh, Horrible. So, like, this Mr. Mental Muscle stuff, I've lived this. It's not just a, yeah. like, I know the name's gimmicky. It's a tongue twister, but I've lived this. So, basically, I think the world evolved too fast because if you look at, say, the early 1900s. So, from our standpoint, that's forever ago. But that's within some people's, like, one generation before. Yep. Like, if you have grandparents born in the 1920s that are still with us, that's one generation before them. Yeah. So we lived in a world where in 1903, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, their first flight. So once that happened, what happened a few years later? World War I. Mm -hmm. So they went from the first flight with this little bulky 
a plane that got like six, seven feet off the ground went maybe 19 miles per hour. And within 10 years, a decade, they were flying, shooting each other. Mm. So the world, and war is not a good thing. The same thing happened with cars. I think exact, in like exactly. early 1900s. It, is, it uh, all paralleled. Ford had like, he created an automobile. Mm. And then I think 10 years later, there were 16 million cars. Something wild Something like, like that. that. And Ford, he was so Without cute. roads. And that, that's the crazy <laughs> part. So you see, that's a perfect example how we evolved from a psychological mental standpoint so fast. Because before that, there was no electricity or very little electricity. It wasn't worldwide. And that, so those three things, planes, cars, and electricity, all kind of uh, evolved yeah. over the f- same period because people didn't even want to use the electricity. That's the funny thing. People were collectively against it because there was a big incident in New York. I, I think it was in the city, though. And this guy was working on the wires, right, up, up top. He slipped and got electrocuted in front of hundreds of people. Mm. So a mass ex- execution. Demon. So electricity is ba- demonic. Ba- <laughs> basically, that's exactly what happened. So... Thomas Edison, name sound familiar, yeah. and um, the different companies, General Electric, all of them were trying to prove, like, no, this is safe. So you know what they did? Kind of looks dumb looking back, hindsight, but in the moment they thought this was good, yeah. they started executing animals to show how humane electricity was. It's like, see, that elephant got electrocuted. He's, he's dead. It was quick and easy. Oh like, what? God. You just killed an elephant or a horse. So get to the point. <laughs> the electric chair. It, 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 <laughs> but that was the next step. And they did a human, and it was... Horrible. Because <laughs> they use DC current uh-huh. instead of AC current. And you know Tesla, he's the one who said, let's use AC. Yeah. And everyone who backed him, Westinghouse, they're like, yeah, th- this is the way to go. Edison wanted DC because Edison, great entrepreneur, amazing, brilliant man, but he was hard-headed in his ways and he lost that battle. Yeah. But get to the point, we went from walking horse and buggy to planes just getting eight feet off the ground to fighting wars and then 50 years later to the moon. Mm-hmm. And then now we can talk to people in instant seconds. So going to the point of depression, so it's, or just mental health in general, if we compare each other of how efficient we are in responding, because communication is key, right? It's cliche. Communication is key. But communication has changed. Yeah. Because think about this. In our parents' days, Chris Rock made a joke about it. He said, I would go, my father would go all day to work. I could have died, and he wouldn't know until he got off at eight. Yeah. Think about that. That was only yeah. 40 years ago. Like, that wasn't a long time ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now it's like, if someone, like a girl, don't, you don't text her back in time, oh, he's not that interested. Blocked. <laughs> so isn't that kind of, dep- and I'm big on mental health, obviously, and if you even get to like med- men's mental health, I'm not trying to go red pill or anything like that. I'm not- <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go there real quick. Okay, let's we can go, go there. Let's go but, there real quick. Go into that. Think about how damaging, in general, not just for men, but in general, where we tie these expectations. Going back to that, that dopamine response, we're priming ourselves mm-hmm. for expectations that aren't realistic. Like, why should I hold someone to a standard of if they don't communicate me every 20 minutes to an hour. Now that's extreme, but I've seen and heard cases, Mm -hmm. not personally, luckily, but I've had friends who girls or people would be like, Hey, you, she, she stopped talking to me because I didn't respond all day. Cause I was working an eight hour shift, a physical labor job. My bad. I used to work Mm -hmm. at a, um, another job I had. I worked at a women's prison for a few months and I couldn't bring a phone in, Mm -hmm. meaning I was unreachable for 10 hours a day. Yeah. So it's like, this is unrealistic. So going to the point, we set these standards and it can vary. It doesn't have to be just communication, but think about jobs. People are less employed, or if they get employed, it's not enough to live. Mm-hmm. I have my parents, they're a little bit older, born in the 50s and early 60s. And it's like, oh, if you, they don't say this, but I know a lot of people from that generation might say this is like, oh, just work hard, bootstraps and all. That. That's great. I bootstrapped and I, I've been, I slept in a car while being on ESPN like that that's happened to me Oof. so it's like talking about mental health is like these expectations I'm trying lack of trying I don't think is the issue I think it's just we have these standards that don't aren't congruent with what our expectations are like mm-hmm. we expect here but we can only give there and that gives this incongruence where our brain going back to that those those three cycles I talked about the perception the planning the error detection and the reinforcement so now re- perception is okay this is how my life should look nice car bunch of beautiful girls on my page f- flying out to Vegas or Dubai, whatever. Mm-hmm. And let's be real. 99.9% of people will never go out the country. Matter of fact, the poorest person in America is, co- is still collectively better than majority of the, mm-hmm. the world. Yeah. So if that's the standard we're trying to f- put on the forefront when we say the world's so bad and it's like, well, that's what we're living in. How can you expect to have a good mindset? Not saying it's a cop out, mm-hmm. but it's like, that's what we're working with. So we need to have a better, I guess, uh, standard of where we want to be and where we should be. Yeah. What do you think people need? Like, is there, are there some like needs that people need to head towards in order to 
maybe not have depression or anxiety? Keep it simple because the more you want, the more you're going to need after that. And the more you're going to need after that. Like I joked earlier, I left my shoes on the way here. I came from <laughs> Florida. Got here. I was like, dang, I had to run get some shoes. I got some cheap uh, $20 shoes. They already broke. I had them for all of, oh, man. I won't even say a day because I got Insert here. Insert Vivo ad here. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually wear those, right? <laughs> Give me a deal, Vivo. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it, that's that's the world I live in. I, I'm simplistic. Like yeah. I said, I don't wear anything really if I have to pay for it. Like I wear my stuff. I wear Dustin's brand. I, wear, I work with Juliana Pena. I, work, I wear her brand. I wear Phil's brand. If you got some stuff, I wear your brand. I'd like to get my clothes that way. Call me weird or cheap. I don't know what you want to call it, but that's how I wear all my clothes are that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's just an example, but it's like that standard of you're always going to want more no matter what, if you say, so that's called the anchoring effect. You're, you're familiar with that term? No. So Give it to us. So it's another, We're not familiar with anything. We're stupid. <laughs> See, I talk to everyone and always preface it with that. Speak because, for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, kind of stupid. So the anchoring effect, we're all stupid in something. How yeah, about that? Absolutely. So the anchoring effect is another cognitive bias. So simply put, I'm going to sell you my car. Say it's a used 2015 uh, Honda Civic. And you want it. You need a car, whatever. I say, all right, Mark, I'll give it to you or sell it to you for $25,000. you are like, sounds good. Let me get a week. I got to get the money. I'll be back. You come back a week later. I got that $25,000. You know what? Um, I'm actually going to sell it for forty. dollars Obviously, you don't want to pay more. But what's the problem? You got anchored with that first price. Now, that's more extreme because it's buying a car, but you can even do it with lesser things. So our brain gets primed with the first piece of information, and it holds that. That's why I call it an anchor. It holds us to that point because mm -hmm. you could literally say, well, actually, this is actually worth more. And it could be. Let's say it is worth more. You just misquoted them. They're not going to want to pay 40000 or $10 more or whatever it is because that's the first piece of information. And going back to the standard being set with people – why are we more depressed than ever? You got 12-year-olds, unfortunately, taking their own lives. And it's because you always have to have the more. It's, it's just how we're wired. So if you start fancy car and house, which most people are not going to achieve. I know it sounds more, but I'm not saying chase your dreams, people. Do it. But be real. That ah, Man, I'm going on a tirade right now. No, it's You're fine. familiar with survivorship bias. This is my favorite bias. Go for it. So I like to bring things like a story full circle. You familiar with the... The uh, song, I Will Survive. Mm -hmm. First I Was Afraid. I don't sing. So, <laughs> First I Was Afraid. There we go. Yeah. So that song explains survivorship bias perfectly. And it's cliche that it is called that, but I'll get to my point. Uh -huh. So the guy who wrote it, Dino Fakaris, he was a writer for Motown. Might be for some of y'all time. So he wrote for Motown Records from the late 60s, early 70s. Got laid off in, I think, 1976. Yeah. So what happened, he was like, I got to get another job writing songs. That's my passion. I love it. And he had some hits. He definitely pinned some hits for Motown for different artists, but he wasn't finding new work. So one night he was watching a movie. I forget the name of the movie, but he wrote the theme song. So the movie came on. He heard the theme song. He's like, you know what? This is a sign. I'm not giving up. And he said, I will survive. And he started writing there, and that song came out of it. Damn. But wow. guess what? It didn't take off. That's 1976. That song got dropped in 1978. So mm -hmm. what happened for those two years? So for two years, he couldn't find a, a, a label to help put it out and produce it. So a label came up and said, we have an artist, Gloria Gaynor, who had decent success in disco at the time. And he said, I want to write a song called Substitute. So he's like, sure, but on one condition that I get the song, I will survive as the B-side to the track. So it's like, sure. So Gloria Gaynor had just heard her back pretty badly on tour, and her mom was overcoming a sickness. So when she read the lyrics, she said it brought, brought such conviction to her because she could relate, not just because the theme is overcoming a bad breakup or something, but she was surviving life. Yeah. So she said, they said they did it in one take. One take, Jay. They got it. Whew. And got you got goosebumps. that song. Yeah. It won the Grammy for disco, best disco, which is the one and only disco Grammy because disco was obviously on its way out in the late 70s. Yeah. So the moral of the story would be what? Keep working hard. Don't give up on your passions and you will survive and be great, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. That's the bias. Because let's think about it. How many times do people do their best? push their best foot forward, try the hardest, put in full effort and still mm -hmm. don't make it. So that's the bias. So perfect example. You ever seen a house or a car from like 50, 60, 80 years ago, whatever, a long time ago. Yeah. And you're like, they just don't make them like they used to no more. <laughs> this, this shoddy craftsmanship, people just, this plastic houses, whatever, right? That's a survivorship bias. You know why? How many houses from 1902 are still standing? You might have one or two that are landmarks, right? Uh -huh. But the, the bias is your mind's assuming that the thing that lasted longest is the ideal one. Yeah. Look at the ruins 
in uh, Greece, Rome, Egypt. This generation is so weak. Exactly. <laughs> but let's guess what? Every generation had that friend. Mm-hmm. Like, 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 you know how people say, that ain't real music. <laughs> <laughs> follow me with this. Follow me, follow me with this. So this can go back forever. So you can be like, but that's Elvis. true. No, no, listen to me. You, I'm no, the no, worst no. I'm gonna kill that for you right now. Yes, so sir. think about it. What you consider real music, right? Uh, like '90s hip hop, right? Yes, sir. Before that, the soul generation, like our parents, the Temptations, that was real music. But for their parents, it was like uh, Billy Holiday. Now that's real music. Then go back far enough. Is it's uh, uh, Johann Bach? Like, not nah, that Bach. <laughs> That's, that's some real music, man. That, that's that Beethoven. Slaps. That's some real music. And it can dun, go dun, all, dun, dun, dun. Exactly. And it, it could go all the way back to Caveman Days. <laughs> like, that's real music. But that's yeah. a bias because you only see what lasts. He broke something again. So the takeaway from all that, the takeaway all, all of that was don't always believe. Does not say don't believe the, the survivors, the winners, because yeah. they do have a story and they do help us. But I argue you will learn more from the ones who didn't win because hey, you, you lost everything in a stock crash. Can you inform me what you did? And you know not to do that because everyone who, who won, go to Jordan. Hey, man, how did you become the best basketball player of all time? I know, debatable. But I just did it, man. I'm 6'6", six, six and I can dump from the free throw. Just do that. Okay. <laughs> 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 like, what, what do I do next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But ask the guy who got cut from the NBA and he was the same skill set as Jordan, or not skill set, but mm-hmm. similar what happened? Well, you know, I wasn't going to practice. My agent told me to sign earlier because let's talk about the draft just happened in the NFL and there's people who don't take the deals and guess what? Mm-hmm. NFL says for not for long. So the bias is don't always go for the winners because Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, they dropped, my students used to do this all the time at the community college I worked at. They're like, well, Gates and, and Zuckerberg mm-hmm. dropped out. Oh, really? Where they drop out from? <laughs> Harvard. <laughs> no offense, we're at Broward College. I, I respect the school because I worked there for, for six years, but it ain't Harvard. And mind you, they were going to be that regardless. Because yeah. their mindset, because I asked my students, I'm like, do you even have the mindset to even be them those guys? Probably not, because you're telling me, well, I didn't finish my work because I had to work at 12 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, oh, so I have no life outside of this, huh? Mm-hmm. And some of them knew what I did outside of it. So it's like, mm-hmm. I spend three to four hours with y'all, but I'm going, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm working with clients. I'm doing business plans. Sometimes I fly out. Boo-hoo. And I was like, yeah. at that time, I'm 35, about to be 35 now, but I was like 20, 26. So yeah. I'm like, I'm, some of them were older than me. Uh-huh. So it was hilarious having someone that was like 32 and I'm 26 giving me excuses. <laughs> Hey, man, you got to understand it's hard. And I had a daughter. So it's like, huh? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So survivorship bias is don't succumb to the people or the things that survive because it doesn't tell the full story. Mm Mm-hmm. Power Project family, quality sleep can make everything with your health and fitness easier, which is why we've partnered with Hostage Tape. Now, we've been talking about mouth tape for years and nasal breathing for years. But one of the problems that we've had with tape is we all like to rock facial hair. And a lot of the mouth tapes we would use would fall off of our face at night. Hostage Tape doesn't fall off your face if you have a beard or if you're not a man and you don't. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> you, you don't need a beard, right? But either way, Hostage Tape makes sense. It'll stick to your face when you're asleep. You'll have better quality sleep because you're breathing through your nose all night long. It is a no brainer. And if you head to hostagetape.com slash power project, you'll be able to get the power project annual deal, which is a year's supply of hostage tape for 55 cents a day. You'll be saving $150 on the typical yearly deal. You're going to get two free tins and a blindfold. It's a no-brainer. So head there right now and get yourself some hostage tape. Links in the description along with the podcast show notes. Shut your f***ing mouth when you sleep. Enjoy the show. I heard a quote, uh, something to look forward to, someone to love, and something to do. It's from Elvis Presley. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you think that is a like healthy thing to have some of those things in mind um, when you're trying to have a good mindset and just feel good about yourself? Oh, that's pretty good. Something to look forward to, something to love, and something to do. That kind of encapsulates it pretty much. I know I said a lot of stuff, but yeah. you narrowed it down to three. Mm-hmm. Because if it was something to look forward to, that's that expectation. And then something to love, that's something you have to be rooted in because, let's be real, life ain't all about making it big. or Obviously, it's cool, I guess, but it's more to it. This research has shown that there's something called social fitness, which is a good predictor of of life satisfaction, not happiness. That's a misconception. Happiness comes in Social fitness, you said? They call it social fitness. It's basically... Your social circle, social circles, how you adapt, as far as like your friend group, your work group. So it's more so how health, so like physical fitness. Yeah, my health. group's not very good, so I need to. <laughs> but <laughs> well, we're doing pretty okay. depressed. <laughs> well, these are things you can always work on. So, nah, I know. 
Oh, you can get it. I Tough believe. audience. Rip <laughs> 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 it, bring it back. Okay. <laughs> so um, so yeah. So I agree with that because it, it simplifies everything I'm saying into those three terms. Obviously, I would love people to hear what I'm saying too. But it's it's like it's something to do, not it's putting it into action. So I agree with that. Mm-hmm. I never heard that before. What, what song is that? Is it just a quote? Oh, it's just a, a quote from him. I saw it um like at like a Hard Rock Cafe. It was like on the wall and it had like a signature of his. And uh, that was the quote. Mm-hmm. What were the the, uh, the specific names of the apps you're mentioning that you use? Because I know, like when you mentioned apps, some people are like, "I want to download whatever app he's talking about." So, is it something you can download, or is it something you got to like subscribe to? So, both kinds. So, one is called Soma NPT. So mm-hmm. that's Soma S O M A, and N is in uh, Nike. Uh, P is in Paul, T is in Tom. So Soma NPT, that's the one that when I was describing how I get all the statistics, the variance and all that, yeah. that app is great. But the only reason I say yes and no is because it's made more so for practitioners. Okay. Like you can use it. It's, it's, it's just not, it's just something that I wouldn't say to buy because the pricing point is much higher because it's intended for people who are going to have clients yeah. and have IDs because all my clients have an ID that would cost a, a mount for each ID. So you can get yeah. it for yourself, definitely. Gotcha. It's just be mindful of that. But it's a great app. I, I The owner of it, I uh, he messaged me frequently with new articles because he does a lot of research with it. So it's verified through sports, military, all types of populations that use it. So Soma mm-hmm. MPT. And also I have my drills and tasks that I have on my site. So I have access to like the drills you saw earlier. I've, I've probably a few, almost a hundred of them. Mm. So it's really for movement, vision tracking, thought process, mindfulness. So I have that accessible on my website. Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm actually kind of curious about this because you said you you do work with youth with this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Do you notice a difference? Because I know how we were just kind of joking about, oh, this generation is weak or whatever. But do you notice a difference with like kids and teens nowadays? Because I mean, when we were all teenagers, we didn't have access to phones. Like there is comparison, but there isn't comparison to the world. You know, there's in comparison to a bunch of people in your age group that are just killing it out life while you're still learning things, right? Do you notice a difference with how they look at things? More positive, negative, et cetera? So I guess I, I probably picked that up when I was working in the schools as a middle school and high school teacher. So okay. and that was 2013 to 2016. Mm. So I think that was like the turning point for the world. That was when right it started. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I would say that generation, they definitely have more open-mindedness to things. And I think that's a good skill or trait to have because you're more likely to try but at the same time, I think they, from what I have saw, they're more uh, critical because in the schooling system, and this is my criticism as a former uh, secondary educator, is that they emphasize a lot of things that aren't really imperative to their lifelong success. So I can say this now, I don't teach anymore, Yeah. So, but it, most teachers will agree with this, but they have to put in the curriculum. There was times where I got challenged when I was like, you know what, I want to do stuff to help them so they can be more flexible in their thinking and be able to push forward in life. But it's like they want to say, no, this is the test they got to take. Stick to these standards. Keep them in line for that. And let's get our our standards met. And mm-hmm. that was it. So if you put in that situation, going back to the expectation, reward, all that stuff, the expectation is if you don't pass this, you stay in this grade or you don't grab Whatever the, the, the result is, yeah. it's pretty high stakes. Who wants to have that do or die pressure for I would say 12 years, but let's say eighth grade at least. So that's five years of that. That's a lot to put on a person who typically doesn't even know who they're going to be yet. Yeah. That's, that's not fair at mm-hmm. all. And I, I didn't like that. But that, I think that gives them, like I said, the open-mindedness to try. But then it gets brought right back down because now they have the standard of you got to be perfect. Like going back to Carol Dweck, that growth versus fixed mindset. Yes. Like if you have a growth mindset, you're able to say, I'm not tied to an A. I'm not tied to a grade. But they're, they're taught the other stuff fixed mindset hey you need to get this grade you need to get this score and that just breeds the general and it's literally my daughter is uh eight so she's a little under that and i'm I'm, because she's taking these similar not to that level but they're Mm -hmm. still taking standardized tests and it's like where's this gonna put them because they're gonna get the full force of it because they're 100 percent iphone they're 100 Mm percent zoom during covid yeah she was doing zoom classes so it's like I don't know what the world's going to look like when we're in our, like, 70s, 80s. Like, that's going to be an interesting place. I'm hopeful for it, but I don't know. Yeah. When it comes to comparison for yourself, do you try to block it or do you let it kind of creep in and start to maybe uh, start to head in a different direction? Like what, imposter syndrome type stuff? Like Yeah, like you mentioned Ar- Andrew Huberman and some other uh, famous people that are in the minds, <laughs> mindset, minds, you know, uh, talking about mindfulness and the brain and so on. 
Yeah, that's a great question because I deal with it a lot and I'll be pretty open and vulnerable on this because like I said, I'm very competitive, but in a healthy way, like I want to be the best I can be, but I do look at those guys and people similar. And one thing is I got to stop doing and I, I gotten better at it is not to feel a certain way when I see their stuff get reshared from people who I even know personally or just follow me. And it's like, you don't share my stuff. <laughs> and it, it's not even a bad thing because it, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But I take it as not as, like you said, uh, that sounds normal and healthy. Exactly, but, but some people take it, like you said before, that why didn't the coach say yeah. me? So I don't do that. Instead of being, why did the coach say me? Instead, I see it as, you know what? I'm not mad. Let me do what I need to do so that is what I get. Because I know I'm doing good things. I have to reinforce because with imposter syndrome, I said this to you earlier, it's like, it just means that you're, you're on the right path. You're passionate. You care. But when you let that imposter become your roommate and move in with you, mm -hmm. and he's sitting on the couch eating chips like, hey, man, <laughs> you suck. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like it, let's be real we we take the most crap from ourselves oh, think yeah. about it i, I oh, tell yeah. clients i'll be like name your inner voice whatever you say in your head name it bob john larry whatever because you wouldn't let a random joe who you don't know talk crap but for some reason we like our the person that has to be us all the time so going back to that imposter get that guy off your couch he might knock on the door and say hey man you don't see what you're doing tonight and sometimes you're like, man, I ain't kicked it with my boy in a minute. And you open the door and it's like, no, 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 get out. Yeah. So it happens to me. This and that, is bringing me to the Chappelle skit that we watched on the show before. Which one? <laughs> the one where he's eating the chicken and the fish. <laughs> uh, Do you remember on the plane? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Catfish. <laughs> like dancing on it. <laughs> oh, that was a great skit. <laughs> that was a great skit. Eating chips Chappelle. telling you that you suck. Basically. And the thing is, we let them keep... Use it in real life. Imagine real life. That's why I like it making it tangible. Imagine a real person sitting there saying, you suck. You're not going to make it. You're not even supposed to be here. You pro Most people, I'll say, some people might succumb and be like, okay, they're very agreeable. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'll say 50 plus percent at least will say, get the hell out of my house. Yeah. But we don't do that with ourselves because I guess it's like, I say it's kind of like a, um, an expectation of perfectionism mixed with a little bit of high standards and a little bit of doubt. You put those together, that's a recipe for imposter syndrome because now it's like, I know there is things I'm not the best at. True. That isn't, I say, confirming all negative truths or countering all negative truths, the art of can't. So if you counter a negative truth, that's saying I, I, I acclimate to what I know is true. Mm -hmm. I may not be the most confident or I may not be the best basketball, whatever it is. Now, how do I counter it? What can I control to be better or do to be better? Or if you confirm it, it's like, yep, I just suck. And some people confirm it. So it's a matter of how do you go about it after you get that negative thought and that, that creeping in that imposter. That's mm -hmm. what I would argue is a problem, not that it happens. Because anything worth having, you're going to have doubts. That means you actually care. Yeah. Anxiety, stress, like I said, no more saber-toothed tigers. It was meant to get us ready for something. And now, it used to be living and dying, but guess what? We take away those saber-toothed tigers. Now it's getting our business off the ground getting our new spouse happy or whatever it is, new baby, whatever it is, you replace those stressors with these new age, new age stressors, which kind of goes back to what you said about the discrepancy of mental health getting worse because these new stressors, you flip it on like a light switch, right? The light comes on. Okay, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. Stress goes away, but you don't turn the light switch back off. And guess what? Talk about like allostasis and all that stuff, homeostasis. You're literally physically making your body ready for a danger that isn't there. And it's like, hello, lights are on, anyone here? Mm -hmm. And then physically... Your body starts breaking down muscle tissue. You get sicker easier. You're not going to sleep as efficiently. So that's why this whole the mind-body connection is more than just like lip service. It literally plays on the other. Let me ask you this, man, because I know you're not like you don't work with people on their diet or whatever. But if you're trying to become a better athlete, you know where you stand. You know you are not the best right now. Maybe you're new and you're a beginner. You understand that. Now, we within like this whole diet culture community right now, there's this idea of self-love and obviously loving yourself where you are. And there's also ideas of, yeah, you don't need to change your your body, all this type of stuff. But you do know, like, for example, if you're a white belt in jujitsu, you suck and you're trying to become a black belt. There are changes and progressions and habits you need to build to become a black belt. Well, if you're 50 pounds overweight and you're unhealthy, you need to love yourself for who you are, but you can't act like there's no change that needs to be made so you can become healthier. You know what I mean? What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on the idea of self-love and that type of <laughs> I idea? I have a few. I have a few. And, hey, I, I'm keep it slightly PC, but not. So, basically, my first thought is, why would you even want to make yourself worse? That, that's the first thing I'm going to think. Like, you're making yourself worse by not 
acclimating to a better diet or better lifestyle, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is why not get better? Because isn't life just a either you're changing upward or you're changing downward? So you're literally saying, I don't want to get better. And now from the actual like the culture of it, I asked the lady, her name is Amy Morin. She came on my channel a few um, months ago. She's a best-selling author. She wrote a book called The 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. It's Ooh. a bestseller. She has like four versions, I think, for women, for parents, and so forth. And basically, she talked about this. I asked a similar question, and she actually gave a good answer about that's very detrimental because this idea of self-care or self-love is strictly just feeling good. That's a very hedonistic way to live, and I, that's my criticism. <sighs> yeah. We are very hedonistic because think about it. Once upon a time, there was uh, consequences for being living in the moment, YOLO, all that stuff. You only live once. It's like, yes, yeah, so don't die. Right? <laughs> you only live once, so uh, don't die. Yeah. So think about 18, whatever. Hey, 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 don't do it. I'm about to say 18. <laughs> let's, let's assume in a, a I got world you, bro. where... I got you. Because Go honestly, it. it'll be different depending on what side of the fence you're on. <laughs> but let's assume a while ago. A yeah, while ago. A while ago. <laughs> if I made these hedonistic decisions where I ate up all the food and nothing was left for anyone else in my family that we just spent 13 hours in the field working, Yeah, who's going to suffer? All of us. We yeah. die. Calories were life. Like another author, Tai Tashiro, I know I'm throwing it, but these guys, they, they're great at what they do. What's the name of this author? Uh, tai Tashiro. Okay. So he came on my channel as well, and he talked about in his book, The Science of Happily Ever After. He broke down to calories. Mm. He did his research. So he said about 1,700 calories was about the the average expenditure of someone like in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. And the work they did would be about uh, 1600. So you're talking about a 100 calorie discrepancy, meaning they, they're they just under what they need to live. So that means wherever they worked, they had to make up for and ration and all that stuff. So he correlated this with like marriage and how it used to be about that type of stuff, duty. So going to the point is like, now we don't have to do that anymore. So it's easier, like say going back to that hedonistic lifestyle, Back then, if you ate up all the food or didn't work your share, and because that was the exercise back then, you mm -hmm. worked in the field 12 hours and your family got the crops, your, your uh, sisters, they did the milk and all that stuff. So if you didn't do that, you, you starved. But now we don't have to worry about it. There's a McDonald's everywhere. Yeah. There's a Walmart everywhere. There's a convenience store everywhere. And I went to the store um, a few days ago back home, and it's not a shot to this person, but they were with their kids and they all were overweight. These kids could have been more than seven, eight years old. And so was the mother. Mm -hmm. And convenience stores, they have food now. Like, remember, it used to be just the, the junk food, like the, the burritos and stuff. But now they're having, like, meal-type stuff. At, so I don't know how it's up here in Sacramento, but back yeah. home, they, mm -hmm. they'll have, like, like chicken uh, meals and stuff, like, almost like Popeyes-type stuff. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And she had bags full of it. And it's, like, it's getting to the point where I think subconsciously we don't even realize we're doing it because the world is just so convenient and safe. And I think Jordan Peterson said this where strong times – make easy or strong men make easy times easy times make weak men weak men mm -hmm. make hard times or strong times and people take it as a just a, a phrase but let's look at the i was history teacher the history does it supports this mm -hmm. yeah hard times the great depression what happened after that the baby boom after that okay the the 80s uh, there was a market drop there then in 2000 so it went up again with the tech boom then went back down with the market crash in 2000 I hate to say it, history is a very good indicator of the future. If you take that out, that's why when it comes to like the hindsight bias and all that, it does have a role. Mm -hmm. But we got to the point where people don't care anymore because it feels good. Oh, do what makes you happy. Self-love. Self oh, I have a spa day, so I'm canceling on everything. Mm -hmm. Wait, so you cancel on your job who needs you to work. You cancel on your friends who need you to do whatever you were going to do or whatever it was just so you can go get your your. I need my feet me rubbed. time. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of detrimental to self-love. If you loved yourself, you would have made sure that you handle what needed to be done to be better without having to negate your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And that's what Amy Morin said. Like, she, that's her take on it. And I agree with that. Yeah. Me time or self-love is not necessarily <clears throat> negating your responsibility. It's like knowing what was going to help you because things could help you that don't feel good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, might, you might not like it. If I said, hey, and I have to do this, think about with my military and law enforcement. When I work with them, they're really, they're, my dad's a police, so obviously hats off, but even the ones I work with hats off to all of them. If I was sugarcoating their, say, their response times and all that stuff, nah, man, you look great. And it wasn't. And I say, you know what? You're mm -hmm. a little, about two tenths slower than everyone else. So let's see what's going on and we fix it. If I don't do that, that could cost them. Like there's real ramifications. And I think that's the problem. There's no real, I could, I could message you in, in England and say, screw you, buddy, I'll, I'll hurt you. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to see you. 
I'm safe. What did Mike Tyson say? Everyone's got a plan to get punched in the mouth. And I, I'm not trying to advocate violence, but not enough people have been punched in the mouth. Yeah. Dang, am, am I going to get canceled today? Nah, <laughs> no, bro. Uh, we I'm were, playing. I'm playing. I don't, I don't care. When we were talking a little bit earlier about comparison, I think there's some healthy things that can come from it. I think uh, most great people and most great things come from somewhere else. So, you know, they come from some other idea that they saw. You mentioned... You had a professor that had an impact on you. You were in a particular class and it changed your life forever. And then, you know, what do you immediately do, you know, once you start to learn from that mentor? You start to try to act as much like them as you can, you know, maybe even mimic them. Maybe you're even, you know, uh, looking up books they read. Like you're trying to almost like jump into their head in some weird way. And I think, uh, you know, somebody listening to uh, Joe Rogan or Andrew Huberman and being like, man, they got so many listeners. And I think that's, I think that can be healthy. And you could say, well, uh, I feel like I have a lot to share. Maybe I should do a podcast. These are all things you have to make sure that you are, um, that, that you actually are going to like and hopefully love. And you'll have to kind of work your way backwards from the end is what I always think is helpful. Like how long do you really want to do this for? Because if the answer is not like at least five or 10 years, then you, you probably, you know, this show has already been going on for, I don't know, like eight years or something like that, maybe even longer. But I think those are all questions that, that are healthy to ask yourself. And I think it is how somebody turns into something. So comparing yourself to somebody, I think can be healthy. I think you just have to be kind of careful that you don't fall into the like, why are they getting so much attention and not me? Mm-hmm. It's more like I think you should uh, ask a different question, frame it differently and say, I, I wonder what they're doing. I wonder kind of like what recipe they're following to uh, get this kind of attention. They're obviously doing a great job in some way to get that many eyes on them, to get that many comments and likes and so forth. Yeah, that, you make, you're making good points. Like you got you have a psych degree by chance, psychology? No, i just been studying I love it when people time. who study yeah. and understand it more than I like. Well, I want to say that, but they get it differently. That's why I like mm-hmm. that because you just described something called social modeling. So this is a theory in psychology by um, Albert Bandura, who's a psychologist who looked at how we emulate others' behaviors. He did a famous experiment with something called the Bobo doll. So basically they had some kids look at someone, like an adult, interacting with this doll, whether it was just playing with it or beating it up. <laughs> so let's say I went in there and beat the mess out of the doll, just... And then <laughs> just walk up to a bunch of kids, have a doll, stab the fuck out of it. <laughs> basically, that's basically what. But this is what they saw though. Yeah. The kids took it and ran with it. Ooh. So let's say I was just punching it. There were some kids who were like bang, 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 bang. So they escalated the shooting. Yeah. And this is like in the '60s. So he came up with this theory of social modeling. So what you just said describes that. So we shape ourselves to the ones who we want to be like. So the thing with this is when I look at it, um, it goes kind of into. Uh, uh, you familiar? There's a guy named. Uh, he just actually passed. He was a psychologist named Anders Ericsson. Mm. He had a name, but I yeah. Know. He he his work was the the foundation. Yep. <laughs> so there it is. Let's look at that real quick. <laughs> so older persons throwing yeah. the uh, they'll do whatever they do, like uh, inflated punching bag looking thing. Mm-hmm. He has a clown. Yeah, I, I had a bunch of those when I was a Bobo kid. Bobo the clown. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, we're the kids. I know. I'm waiting for it. Oh man, I don't. I think that's a. I don't know. I can't tell if it's a guy or girl on my screen. Yeah, they're all punching the crap out of it, kicking it. <laughs> that kid needs to work on his form, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now the kid's picking it up, kicking the he shit out like of it. He's like 60 years old right now. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, so people are just uh, mimicking each other. And you think about this happens in music a lot. It happens in, in rap. Sometimes somebody new that's coming up, they're like, oh, he's trying to be like so-and-so. Mm-hmm. Right and and then uh, look at Kobe Bryant. I mean, Kobe See? Bryant modeled everything. <laughs> Kobe, a hammer, a hammer, <laughs> crazy <laughs> bastard. It's like this is a good tool. <laughs> they get Oof. way more aggressive. Kobe Bryant, you know, mimicked Jordan through and through on the court, stuck his tongue out and everything. And that's why it's good in that degree. Obviously, not in that degree, yeah. but in that degree is good because going back to Anders Ericsson, he died I think in 2020, and his work was on the science of expertise. So all his work was about looking at chess champions, musicians, like classical trained musicians, like Yo-Yo Ma, Mozart, Tiger Woods, the list goes on. And his work was the predisposition to a book um, by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. Mm. And they bring up something called the 10,000 hour rule. Mm -hmm. So this gets misquoted and and Malcolm Gladwell cleared it up because people hear and they say 10,000 hours to be an expert. But there's more to that, and um, Erickson talks about it more, obviously, in his work, because that 10,000 hours is an average. That's saying three hours a day, every day, for about 
10 years comes at about 10,000 hours. But what he saw was depending on the subject, the, the people, whatever, it could be as short as 3,000 hours or as much as 20,000 hours. So it was more so a, 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 a recommendation. It wasn't that saying that you just do 10,000 hours because one, it has to be deliberate. Because think about this. I've been driving since I was 16, so eight, 19 years. Mm -hmm. I can't go to, I was, in Miami Gardens near my area, there was just the uh, Miami Grand Prix. I can't go out there and do anything with those guys. I'm going to die. For so long. But exactly. So that's where people misconstrue. Because deliberate practice means, one, you get constructive criticism. And you guys coach, so you do this all the time. You can't just be like, all right, you look good. No, it's like, all right, okay, you, your, your knee's kind of buckled when you squat or whatever it is. So you have to have that part. My go-to is let's try something different. <laughs> but that's a good, I love that cue. Because it's not putting them down, but it's reframing them to say, Okay, something might not be the way. So it okay, let's move over this way and try this. <laughs> but that's great. But that's an expert coach, and that's why psychology is great because you don't have to be a PhD. But if you understand the basics, it'll help you be a better coach, better uh, spouse, a better friend, even because it's about understanding your behavior, not about people always say when I was in college, "Oh, you're a psych major." Girl, be like, read my mind. I'm like, that's a psychic. But, <laughs> but basically, it's like it, it does help me understand, but it's a downside too because then I'm like, oh wait a minute, I know what that. And I'm not saying it's 100%, but I hate to say it, humans are not as special as we think. Yeah. We're, we're different to certain degrees. There's differences, obviously. But on a collective, because think why, why did every civilization, major civilization have some form of pyramid? Why did every civilization, civilization have some form of, of irrigation structure that made the society go? Collective conscious, our brains are wired a certain way through hundreds of thousands of years of at least homo, homo sap sapiens species. But obviously there's more to that. So it's like, we're not as different. There's small things that make us different. We say we're special, whatever. That's maybe your mom or your friend, cool. But for the most part, psychology is about predicting uh, likely behavior, predicting mm -hmm. likely, keyword likely. Because with uh, most research, you want to see 60, 70 percent, give or take. With psychology, that, that number is about 50. Yeah. So it's a little more room because social behavior is a lot harder to measure. But the goal of a psychologist, whether it's research or practitioner, is to be able to measure these intangible, make the intangible tangible. And that's mm -hmm. where I come in. So it's like, we have to be able to do that. So when it comes to deliberate practice and all that, you have to have these concepts because if you're just doing it to do it, you're not really getting better. So... What you doing in Florida, man? Isn't it crazy there? Like, are there <laughs> like alligators and shit? Mm -hmm. So I got a story about that. At my first encounter. Florida, man. <laughs> I've had a few encounters with account. alligators. Now, for those who are not from Florida, we get a bad rap. You know Charlemagne the God? Yes. Yeah. So he has a saying. You know the saying? You know I'm waiting for it. So he says, the two craziest people or places are people from certain parts of uh, New York and all of Florida. <laughs> so it's everyone in Florida for some reason. <laughs> so, and I might have misquoted. I, it might even be lesser for the other people. But he said all of Florida. So I don't care if it's North Florida. South, I'm from South Florida. I'm like from a place called Deerfield Beach, which is right outside of uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami. So I grew up in a very di diverse area. But going back to the Gators, every Floridian probably has at least one story. So this is the one I'll mm -hmm. give y'all. I was in third grade. Mm -hmm. oh. I had a teacher named Mrs. Summers. Great lady. She, she definitely set me on a path. She's one of those teachers that understood you. Because there's some teachers that throw you under the rug because they just there to get a paycheck. She was not this. So yeah. rest in peace, she actually just passed, unfortunately, the cancer a mm -hmm. few weeks ago. But um, I stayed in touch with her over the years here and there, but not as much, but it, she she was a good woman. So we went on a field trip. It was in the Everglades area. So Florida, if you don't know, the Everglades was all of Florida. But obviously we've industrialized it, whatever. So there's still parts that is still like that. So yeah. we were in the, um, the canal and it was about, it was every third grade class. So we we're talking about Maybe 200, maybe 200 kids. So we're all split up in groups. My mom was actually a chaperone. So basically, we're canoeing through, doing our thing, da 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 da. And we hit something, and my mom, the chaperone, she's like, Is that a log? And I'm like, I don't know if that's a log. <laughs> and the thing is, we're not too far from the shore because we're on our way back. Yeah. So we're on our way back to the shore. So everyone started panicking, talk about fight or flight. <laughs> So Miss Summers came to into the water and pulled the canoe back to the because like I said we weren't that far from the shore yeah, but yeah. it was like freaking out and she did that she pulled us and everyone was like going crazy and it's like I was what eight years old so uh -huh. it was crazy right so that's just one story but gators they they Ooh. so that was said a gator. dinosaurs yeah it was yeah definitely that Ms. it gets crazier depending yeah. on what area you're in my area mm -hmm. is so like South Florida has a lot of Everglades area out west but where pe most people live. You know, see, like where I call, I'm from, it's called Deerfield Beach. Mm -hmm. I was a joke with my dad who's born and raised there. 
and he his his people moved there I think in the fifties, but he was born and raised there. And I'm like when I was a little, I'm like, Dad, I'll never see any deers in Deerfield Beach. It's like they're gone. <laughs> we mm. killed them all. But basically, it's like that's where it is now. But if you go to certain parts, like more Central Florida area, like outside of like Orlando, yeah. A swamp city, like you know, um, University of Florida, the Gators. Mm-hmm. It's called a swamp for a reason. That's where you're gonna see. I think there's even monkeys up there. This Damn. Is, that's a crazy story. I, I didn't even notice. I found this out like a few months Damn, ago. Really? So this is what happened. They say there was a movie in like the 40s or 30s, a uh, Tarzan movie, <laughs> mm-hmm. and they brought all these monkeys and they just <clears throat> after they finished, just left them. Oh my god! So this generation of monkeys just been breeding for like 50, 60 years. I think it's the same so thing. Fucking stupid. I think it's sometimes. the same story with the gators. I yeah. think they were like released from a zoo or something. The iguanas, shit. though. That's yeah. what that was. Mm. The iguanas there. Do you have iguanas here? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not I don't like think that. any like, place really like has lizards stores. like Florida. Does. So iguanas, if you don't, <laughs> yeah, if you've never seen an iguana, like we have the, I don't know other places in the world, but in the country, I think we have the biggest iguanas. Jesus Christ. They're like this big. And I hate like when people are like, it's not going to do anything to you. I'm like, Fuck I don't you. care, There's man. a video that's viral of a, a raccoon fighting an iguana, and I think the iguana won. They have sharp <laughs> claws. They climb up trees. They can swim. Yo. Iguana, that shit just scares the shit out but of me. But you know what's crazy? They have a, a order out right now. I think the Santa said, you you can legally just kill them all and there's no there's no nothing. They they they're actually a new business right now. Check out Rocket. You found it. Is that it? <laughs> oh, it's fucking Rocket. That's not even the one I saw. Them. That's not even the one I saw. There's one they were they were fading for real. <laughs> I just seen out in your backyard. It's right. Cool. Yeah, but that's, not, his back. that's not uncommon. You no know many times. So my facility, right? Like my facility is in like a warehouse type area, kind of like this, and. Every now and then, a frog would just hop out of nowhere. A big old frog. I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is Florida. Animal, be ready for an animal to jump at, at you. At. There's a funny meme where there's a guy, he said, living in Florida, be like, and it's literally him checking every crevice, every door, every trap. Because it was a joke to the people of the world, but in real, <laughs> that's the one I saw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Yo, you like with all this stuff you're saying about Florida, you think it gets a bad rap, but Florida doesn't Florida get a bad rap. Florida is described exactly as is. <laughs> like, it seems like it's wild. Why is everyone moving? You're from New York. Why are the New York people moving to Florida? Well, it's cold in New York. I think that's what yeah, they're doing. That too. Oh, look at his tail. Oh, yeah. Oh. oh how's what? that for neuroscience? Wait, so, so the raccoon is winning. I yeah, think so. Yeah. Is fucking him yeah. up. Okay, I got it wrong in the raccoon one. I, I wasn't sure. Look at that. Yo, raccoons are savage. Look dude. at them going after. Oh, yeah. And they be, see, I don't know what's going on in Florida, but raccoons are like just chilling in the daytime now. <laughs> <laughs> like they're nocturnal. You see this? This is broad yeah. daylight. Yeah. So something's going on. I don't know if it's rabies. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> Maybe it's rabies or something. Yeah, like, they should not be up <laughs> right now. So I will go, because where I live, <laughs> should not there's, be up right there's something called the Hillsborough. <laughs> Canal, it separates um, where I live in Deerfield Beach to Boca Raton. So uh-huh. you're familiar with that place, or at least heard the name. Yeah. Boca Raton is where most of the people I was just talking about go to, like prominent area. So mm-hmm. there's a, a canal that separates it. I live right on that canal. So that's why I see these things. I see, fo- I have three foxes. I have names from Star Fox, <laughs> Red Fox, and Jamie Fox. <laughs> This true story. I'm not fucking mending this up. I might have a video on my phone somewhere of it. Yeah. But they live in the back because it's, 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 like I said, it's, some parts are still swamp, but where yeah. I live, it's the border between Deerfield Beach and Boca. A fox and, is so pretty too, but you could They're totally cool. Yeah. But up. don't mess with it. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't go near them. No. They make some like weird demonic sounds come out of yeah. the house. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's not cute, but they no. look cute. But yeah, so Florida is. See, it sounds bad, but that's only if you go to those places. Like, let's be real. Most people are going to, like, the hot spots. You're going Miami. to South Beach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're not going to random backyard of Nowheresville, Florida. You're going to the hot spots where you're only going to see models and, and Ferraris and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I see that, too. That's funny about Florida. You'll see that. And then two minutes later, see a Lamborghini. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I remember when I moved back home from college. Because uh-huh. as a kid, I don't really think about this stuff. When I got back, now life matters. Like, I'm a grown man. Money and being able to make money yeah. plays a role in getting in life, getting a girl, all that stuff. Uh-huh. So I started noticing, like, there's a lot of Ferraris and Lamborghinis in South Florida. Like, like I didn't realize this because it didn't matter then. And yeah, I was yeah. like, man. I was asked, like, if I can ask, because I used to work at a auto. This is my fourth job. So <laughs> I used to work at Sears Auto. Yeah. And in the same area. Uh-huh. So every time some guy came, first of all, I was like, in my head, why are you bringing this to Sears Auto? Uh-huh. Take it to Ferrari because they try to be cheap. I'm like, you have a $300,000 car. You want to get a, a oil change that's like $40 cheaper for a high performance. He's like, how much for an oil change? $69.99. It's like, wait, nah, that's a lot. I'm like, your car costs more than my house. <laughs> like, come on, man. But yeah, so it sets up, going back to standards, like mm-hmm. seeing that all life, same thing with athletics. Mm-hmm. This plays into my coaching style as a mental mm-hmm. coach because I grew up seeing some big names that are, were my rivals mm-hmm. or teammates 
that not like Jason Pierre Paul, familiar with him? Mm-hmm. Played with him and kind of he's a DN. I think he plays for the Ravens now, but he, he started with the Giants. Yeah. Uh, he played with the Bucks when they won when Tom Brady came, and now he's on the um the Ravens. So he was my teammate. Uh, me and him and Phil played together. We had so many notable people we either played with against, and that was life in Florida. So hey, Florida's a great place if you can look past the crazy stuff like that. <laughs> I, I I'm biased, I guess, but yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Andrew, want to take us on out of here, yeah, buddy? Yeah, sure thing. Let us know what you guys think about today's conversation. There's a lot of great stuff <laughs> in today's podcast. So drop those comments down below. Make sure you guys hit that like button and subscribe. Uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project uh, all over the place. My Instagram is at I am Andrew Z. And Seema, where are you at? Discord's below. Join so you can get in on the Q&As that are coming up. We're also doing giveaways there. At Seema Yin Yang on Instagram and YouTube. At Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Nick, where can people find you and your services? So find me on IG, YouTube, Twitter at Miss. Mr. Mental Muscle, Mr. Mental Muscle. So I drop uh, weekly videos on mental mm. coaching. I cover topics and current events. So like if something happens, like with the Javante Davis fight that just happened, I talk and I'll give my like insight, like, almost like a reaction, but from a psych aspect so you can get mm. education, content, things like that. Mr. Mental Muscle on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. I forgot to ask you your mindset and what your thoughts are on people setting goals and just being goal oriented. I want to finish on that. Yeah. yeah. So there's process goals, there's performance goals, and there's outcome goals. Outcome is what you want to achieve. That's the easiest one to set because you know where you want to go. Pro- process is the hardest ones because this is the day-to-day. Think of it like a bank, right? You go into a bank. You say, all right, I'm in the bank. Money? No. You have to work to get the money, then go to the bank to deposit the money, let yeah. it sit there. Maybe you invest in stocks. Now crypto, right? Yeah, my kids would always go, just say, like, go to the bank. You know, like, they didn't understand. Credit card. <laughs> but it's the same concept, right? Like, no, so, it still costs fifty dollars. <laughs> so get into your process. What are you doing to get that money to deposit in the bank? It could be figuratively or it could be literally if that's what you're trying to do. So that's the process goal. And then performance is the result of the process. If I do what I need to do day to day, week to week, even hour to hour, because every situation is a different aspect of your goal. Mm-hmm. So that leads to the performance because the performance is how do I actually execute? The process gets me ready, the performance is my execution, and the execution may, keyword may get the outcome. So that's how I do it and look at it. And I would say, get your mind right. Awesome. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Catch you guys later. Bye. Nice one. Damn. I'm glad I caught that ball.